In the beginning, we were born. Then we grew. Everything we knew was new. I'm gonna spread love or hate. I'm gonna spread love or hate. I'm gonna spread love or hate. and ultimate sin to learn what we didn't learn right from the start because nowhere where was place in my heart for hate as we wish you could see through our childhood eyes once again I ask you Sometimes you just, you know, it was just meant to be that way.
Welcome to the machine. Yep, yep. Music machine time. The music machine. This was one of our first topics we ever did. It's almost been four years. Next month. Yeah. Can you believe it? Uh, four, four years. Time flies when you're talking. People could have gotten their degree and talking. <laughs> People can get their degree in talking sh in that amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I earned a degree. Good stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Many topics, many topics. And and what, what got me thinking of revisiting this one? Because um, it's been a while since we looked at uh, uh, music machines, which is where we're going to start, mm -hmm. and virtual machines and, and the benefit of uh, virtual machines. A lot of people are still confused as to what a virtual machine is. and Hopefully after tonight, mm -hmm. they'll start to get a better idea of the benefits of running a virtual machine under your main operating system. When, when you want to check out new software, you want to see if this software is compatible on Windows 11, um, things like that, having a virtual mm -hmm. machine in a virtual machine environment helps you to do that without destroying your 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 workstation testing right yep and it also just gives you that window like you know if somebody else is a user of a daw that you don't use you would be able to install you know like a demo version into a virtual machine just to get in there and see the nuts and bolts see you know how the screens look see what they're looking at when they're looking at a track because that way it's easier to have conversations with them whereas you might be talking otherwise apples to oranges because the way they do it in their daw is way different than the way you do it yeah. in yours so and, and it's good to have that frame of Speaking reference. Speaking of, let's take a look here. I, I rebuilt mm -hmm. our virtual machine. The cool thing, mm -hmm. um, I have a new, I have a new music workstation since you know four years ago. This new um, uh, yeah, yeah. AMD Ryzen machine that my brother built for me last year that has become my music machine. Mm -hmm. So now, not only can I build the virtual machines on this new machine, but it's connected to my keyboard. So. The same keyboard that I use in the physical machine, I can now connect to the mm -hmm. virtual machines. And what I did here, let's see if we can tuck ourselves under it. There we go. And um, mm -hmm. I created a Windows 10 machine. But if you if you look over on the side here, I've also got, you know, I've got a Windows 11. I've got a couple mm -hmm. of Mac OSs that I'm going to be testing out mm -hmm. now. Unfortunately, Mac o that's going to be interesting yeah with the amd well yeah the mac os does not play nice um with amd processors so i'm having a little bit of a problem getting them to work over here but i've got them set up on my intel laptop and got them going without a without a problem i've also got a couple of linuxes that i'm going to be checking out because i want to see if linux is really viable for music making one of the disadvantages with linux um the plugins the vst plugins we use they don't tend to get made for linux they tend to get made windows first and foremost and mac os usually but you almost never see linux versions of these plugins sure but and i wonder you know would a universal um plug-in you know would a plug-in that's designed for the pc side would that work on a linux machine is the question have they worked around it in that um, way, rather than having a linux there, there are some interesting approaches that are starting to be taken where plugins are being shared by a server and think think mm -hmm. like cloud plugins like the plugins mm -hmm. run in the cloud and come over to the the, the daw and that may end up being the long-term universal solution. Like it, it, it's possible mm -hmm. as they develop more and more that your plugins won't matter if they're Mac or Windows or in this case, Linux, they'll run in the cloud and you'll actually load them on any operating system, including mobile. Mm -hmm. That's where I think um, mm -hmm. the biggest possibility is because you're seeing a lot of mobile artists these days and mobile DAWs, Cubasis is a great example. Um, if you're on an iPad and you're using Cubasis, you've got a full blown DAW, but it doesn't load those VSTs that you might want to. So these are the kinds of solutions that 
that are coming down the, the pipe. So mm -hmm. what we have here, this, this is my physical machine. I'm just going to minimize workstation for a minute. This is, this is my, my uh, machine with crazy Ange on my background. <laughs> nice. When I bring up works, mm -hmm. all my virtual machines are living inside of here. It, these are the mm -hmm. beauty of a virtual machine is it's a, it's a folder on your hard drive. If, if I bring up my hard drive mm -hmm. here, bring up my Explorer and I go to my machine folder. These are all the machines that I have set up and I can mm -hmm. copy this folder. I can put it over on my laptop, load up the exact same machine with the same configurations. Um, virtual machines are highly portable. That's part of what makes mm -hmm. them so appealing. You can set it up. As long as the hardware you're using them on is similar enough. There are differences. If you're trying to go 10 generation jump, that could be a problem or you know things like that. Well, even the hardware. It's going from like a super, super old machine to a new machine. The, the, true, true. You, you want a machine that can handle running a virtual machine, which we're mm -hmm. going to be looking at that, um, especially in our first couple of videos. The first couple of videos, we're going to talk about hardware machines. And then we're going to shift into virtual machines and, and their benefits. But if I if mm -hmm. I wanted to copy one of these machines right now, for instance, our, our uh, Windows 10 DAWs machine, the one that I was just looking at, you know, I can copy that folder. The, this machine right now takes 71 gigs. So, you know, it's it's a it's a big folder, but I could copy that over to my laptop mm -hmm. and run this same machine over there. And let's jump back right. over to this machine. This is our talking sh IT DAW testing machine. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at some different DAWs throughout the night, free ones and commercial ones. Because for me, Cakewalk is going through a transition. It's about to become Sonar and a paid product. And not to say I'm going to stop using cakewalk because i've used it before it was free and will probably continue to because i have two thousand plus projects but it's a good time to look at like the different DAWs that are out there there's a lot more than there used to be and i'm always curious as to like you know what's what's available for recording so what i did is i've got We've got Ableton here. And some of these, you know, they're paid products, but they do let you evaluate them. And in, in the case of Ableton, they give you a 30-day trial, which I, I didn't have to activate. Mm -hmm. I, I'm using it in um, demo mode. So I haven't even acti activated mm -hmm. our 30-day trial. And I can actually ch right. check out the interface. But in this case, you're just able to show something about it. Though. Yeah. What I can't do is I can't save. I can't export. So, you know, mm -hmm. you can't use it to actually make a project and make tracks and things. But you can try out the interface and give it a test run. So Ableton mm -hmm. is one you're going to see That's mentioned in several of the different videos. Because they do have a free version and they have a paid version so we're going to be looking at both um some new ones uh that i've never tried before ardor which i would turn these lines off instantly <laughs> <laughs> but our ardor ardor yeah. is a free one so um I, I was interested in checking that out and another one that keeps popping up um it, it You'll see it rec recommended in some of these videos, and uh, I see a lot of people who have switched to it, uh, Bitwig, which I think has been around for a while, but it's really starting to gain a following. Mm -hmm. And then, of, co nice. of course, I, I had to put Cakewalk on. Um, this one's the Cakewalk by BandLab, mm -hmm. so it's still available, probably for not much longer, but if you go over to band lab you can still get it and i i do still highly recommend at least getting it to where they're going to leave off with it it's a very functional daw and even if you do switch over to cakewalk next or sonar 
you might still find some use out of this. I've got over 2000 projects that I'm not ready to convert over to the new sonar yet. Right. And that is the main, the main thing that'll keep you in that, uh, in that silo is having so many projects dedicated already. Yeah. Well, once you, once you convert them over, you can't convert them back. <laughs> and you, I, I need to do some tests to see that everything converts nice, the plugins play nice with the new DAW, um, nothing moves because right. that can happen sometimes. And uh, another mm-hmm. another free one that they're going to be mentioning, uh, LMMS, and um, another one that looks like it's got a lot of power. Uh, I'm going to dig more into that one mm-hmm. when I've got some time. And of course, Pro Tools, um, gotta check out Pro Tools. And this is the Pro Tools free. They do give you like, you know, a a free version that'll let you manage up to three projects. So I wanted to see what they offer for, you know, their free offerings. Um, Normally, I'd be doing Pro Tools on a Mac though. You know, Pro Tools Windows and Pro Tools Mac, not created equally. And, and of course, that is one thing that um, if you were to get a virtual, if you were to get a virtual machine onto an Intel machine, you could put a virtual Mac on there oh, and, and that, test it from that side. That's right? what I'm going to be doing over on the laptop o- over the weekend. Uh, I've got right. I've got the latest Mac mm-hmm. OS and I've got Ventura, the the one from last year. So, you know, when it comes to the Mac side, mm-hmm. it, the latest greatest OS, nice to have, but. <laughs> A lot of times right. the software but being is, close is good. Yeah, the software is usually more developed on one version before the current version. On the Mac side, they they mm-hmm. they upgrade fast and furious. Every year there's a new version with a fancy name, but the software does not always port over to the new versions. Uh, that's the downside to constant updating. Um, it it can complicate your software and you don't want your software to break every time you update your operating system. Right. And some would say that they use that as a, you know, the intentional updating every year so that, you know, the hardware that can no longer sustain, you know, that basically bricks or, you know, is no longer supportable by this release. So then, you know, as the new release comes out, it says, Hey, your hardware is no longer, you know, supported for this. So you need to upgrade your hardware in order to move. Yeah. It's forced obsolescence. So and, and, and the last one that I have set up so far, I mean, there, there's going to be a few more I'm going to be installing as we watch later. I'm going to try to get mm-hmm. like all the ones they recommend into this virtual machine. It's got plenty of space for mm-hmm. me to do my testing. And mm-hmm. Reaper, Reaper was a must. Uh, Jason would have my oh, head yeah. <laughs> if I didn't if I didn't put Reaper on there. So. Um, that's, that's the DAW. As we're looking through, it's like, yeah, Reaper. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the DAWs that we have set up. I've got them all set up under our mm-hmm. IT account. So, you know, mm-hmm. we've got some resources here. Nice. And let's, Solid. let's take a look. That's a lot of choices there too. Let's take a look at our lineup for tonight. Mm-hmm. Because the first the first couple um, that we're going to start with are going to talk about physical machines and uh, specifically building machines for music production, which is it's about the same as if you were going to build a a gaming machine. The one primary difference is you're going to be hooking up audio equipment to it. So uh, usually on a gaming machine, you might not be as. you, you might not be as conscientious about like how many USB ports and things like that with a music machine. You want to be a little more aware of that because you might use more USBs plugging in audio hardware than you would on a gaming machine where, you know, a controller or a few uh, uh, gaming plugs are all you really need. Yeah. And I would even know, uh have thought that, you know, the video card would be another big difference between a gaming rig and an audio rig. But we've talked about that a little bit where some of the newer stuff is more utilizing 
the graphics card more, you know, more than they were in the, and, in the and, past, where before it was a total. Different and I would have thought the same thing. And normally, and this guy that he talks to um, does mention that, like, you know, the you can save money on not spending as much on the video and focus on other aspects because with music making, the video card doesn't really do much. But to make it interesting, the uh, next video, Sanjay, you know, I love his reviews and he built a, a, a new machine for 2024. He's typically, a, I think, an Apple guy. So like this is, you know, a new area for him to be building um, uh, PCs for music. But what's interesting with this one towards the end, he starts to mention that there are GPU driven plugins coming out. So I was like, what? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're going to check this out. And I want to know more. It was coming. Yeah. I, I could see this becoming um, another niche for GPUs where like plugins designed to be optimized through GPUs could do a lot more and handle a lot more than utilizing the CPUs. So, so Sanjay is going to show us what he put together for this box and going to mention some of that. Mm -hmm. and then we're going to shift to um, uh, Chris Titus tech, tech here for an explanation on virtual machines, hypervisors, um, how, how these operating systems function under a main operating system, a, what they call a bare metal machine. Yep. It's a little more complicated than our typical videos, but um, it's as it's actually the easiest explanation I could find. Because when I was looking for an explanation on on virtual machines, I was glad that I already understood it because <laughs> most of them are really yep. designed for techs, network admins. Um, these are the kinds of techs that mm -hmm. tend to start playing with virtual machines, home u home users yeah. and um, most average users don't really think about virtual machines and their usefulness unless you're a programmer or someone who needs to have a sandbox. But mm -hmm. Chris yeah. is going to Chris Absolutely. is going to talk about like the different choices out there and some of the benefits that you get by going with virtual machines. Mm -hmm. And then we're nice. going to slide into the DAWs. And I didn't, I, I actually had even a couple more than this because I was looking at free DAWs. I was looking at, you know, Windows based, uh, Mac based, Linux. And I found different videos for the um, different situations. But what I ended up going with was a nice balance of, um, uh, uh, to start with here, free, uh, Lander. He goes over eight, oh no, the best free DAWs for music production in 2024. And, and these are free. Th these are the ones that mm -hmm. that I've been checking out to make sure that like there is a free option. Some of them do get into, well, you know, you want more bang for your buck, go with the upgrade, but they do offer free options. Right. Love the free yeah. options. Well, it's it's good to know, and it doesn't hurt to start with a free DAW before you go spending five hundred bucks on one. Know what you're looking for. Try a free one, mm -hmm. and get comfortable with a DAW before you spend money on it. Yeah, and again, before you go spend money on a DAW and then realize that you're going to go buy some hardware of some kind, realize that they usually give away a DAW with hardware of certain yeah. types. So if you're thinking about, you know, investing something in something, I would invest into, you know, hardware where they're actually giving you a, a license for something that you can then download and have your own version that's fully, you know, ready. That's to go. why I've been reluctant to buy Studio One, because I know I'm going to get one of those Persona Surface controllers as soon as I can get the extra <laughs> cha-ching. And I know it's mm -hmm. going to come with that. Right, exactly. Exactly. Planning for that. Yeah. yeah. Now I just now, now I just have to get my player. hands on the surface so that I can get the DAW. <laughs> the trick would be like you'd, you'd be you'd be annoyed if you like you know bought Studio One today and then you know got a surface and then it gives you the license. You're like, <laughs> yeah, 
It's like, I should have just yeah. waited. Yeah. Or it'd be nice if you could hold that license for the next upgrade, you know, because, I mean, every couple of well, years you're going to. I think in a lot of ways, they um, with the licensing that they do with the Studio One boards or with the boards that I've seen, is they give you a certain number of licenses. So it might be three, it might be five, but it's licenses so that if your machine dies, you don't have to go through you know major hoops. You can just install it on another machine and you know reactivate it with that same license code a couple of times because they, they know that you're going to go through a succession of machines while you still have, maintain that. Yeah, license. I've been seeing. So it's good that they started doing it that way. Then it, I see, yeah, I seen that option on a couple of different ones. Fruity Loops has that Pro Tools. Um, plus, they understand that in a lot of uh, musician scenarios, they may be working on multiple. I should work on five machines here, so I, I could exactly. load up that DAW on any one of these boxes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Indeed, but you're still the one user, so it's one seat. Yeah, yeah, in, in that, exactly. And and as far as when it's authenticating over the internet, it's coming from one IP. So, you know, they know like all these machines are coming from one room. Right. Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> most of us are similar. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 and the the next one that we have here is from Neo Moon Studios, a, a freshy channel that I came across. And um, this one is more of a balance. It's not just free ones. It's a little bit of free and a, a little bit of the paid ones and what he considers like the best options in 2024. Times are changing. The, I saw some new ones in here and some that I'm, you know, have always been a consideration, but it's good to see that they're still holding strong in 2024. I like the subtext there too. Find one that works yeah, for you. Yeah, and that's really why you got to try a couple of them. And yeah. I couldn't resist Joshua's on on this one. Um, he he puts this list together um, from a, a site called Gear Sluts, which <laughs> is like, "Hey, gear whores, <laughs> I'm one of <laughs> you." <laughs> and and he exactly. he. He put together a good list. After we see the other suggestions, he's going to mention a lot of the same ones. But why I had to include them is because there's a few in here that um, don't get mentioned and should. So this rounds mm -hmm. off uh, uh, all the different DAWs that I would have considered. Between these three videos, they, they cover them all. Ex except nice. for one uh this last one <laughs> is a little unique um it, it's just come out in like the last year uh or it's it's just evolved into what it now is because uh, you probably used ripex in the past um for different things like you know ripping a cd and things like that but this is something totally uh, uh new and different it's a daw that's centered around AI and its specialty is to break down tracks in, in a way that no other seems to be doing. I have seen review after review over on YouTube of people testing this out and just rave reviews about how good it is at separating different audio and channels and um, being able to recreate stems out of full-blown mixed tracks which you know um yeah. we're not uh uh we're not condoning like stealing songs and and you know that kind of approach but at the same time if you're looking to practice or you just want to jam to a tune and you do want to strip out an instrument or a vocal track it's yeah. nice to know how to do it and um how to be responsible about doing it well, the, the perfect example to me would be things like, you know, when I'm in the studio with Angie and then we're just doing, you know, there's just three or four of us in the room playing, but usually the recording that we have is just a phone recording in the middle of the room. So breaking that down to stems just immediately gets that live performance and, you know, is able to now separate those tracks to the point where we could then be able to remix everything so that we can hear everything more clearly, as well as all the live, uh, live gigs that we do, you know, whether it's open jams or whatever, where all the recordings that you're getting there, if it's a full band playing, you can then get that, you know, stemified by you know doing and some that, that would That'd that be would awesome. be the situation where i would find this the most useful it's like oh we got a room oh. recording of ourselves let's see if we can split it up and isolate it 
Thanks, so that's man. going to be coming from Home Studio Simplified, another new channel that definitely I'm going to be going back to. I like the Home Studio uh, uh, channels. Uh, these are the ones I relate with the most. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, some of them are, you know, um, uh, some of the channels that I've seen in the past, you know, some involve, you know, the high end hardware and high end software where they're paying thousands and thousands for what they're using. Others, it's like, here's the free stuff that we can get to. And then others are somewhere in the middle. So it's good that, you know, they cover a lot of ground between the videos that we usually. Yeah. Grab. Well, and, and with those kind of channels, a lot of times you find good tutorials, reviews mm -hmm. on gear. I mean, I love good reviews. <laughs> Before yeah. I spend my money, even, I love checking out what they what they think. And even introductions to other channels. Like sometimes you, you find, you know, one channel and then when you get there, all of a sudden you're getting new recommendations that feed you other channels that are similar that you wouldn't have stumbled on otherwise. Yeah. Also, yeah, very we've, cool. and we benefited from recommendations uh, as as our YouTube algorithm gets smarter and smarter. Some of the topics mm -hmm. practically get thrown at me some weeks. Yeah, exactly. It's a beautiful so, thing. Speaking of good channels, um, one we found last year, Audio University, one of mm -hmm. the most in-depth channels when it comes to like certain information, like how audio works and whether you want a dynamic or a condenser mic and uh, the kinds of information you get on this channel are, are massive and very accurate. Um, he does his homework. Mm -hmm. He talks to other pros and he covers topics that tend to become topics we end up talking about afterwards. And, and what, what he's going to do on this episode um, is he, he's talking to a, a, a computer builder who specializes uh, slick audio who specializes in building music machines, you know, for studios, for musicians who are looking for boxes that are designed for audio, uh, um, production. So he's going to give suggestions that are focused on audio production. Although you, you'll see a similarity to gamers. Like he probably caters to gamers just as much as to audio enthusiasts. Mm-hmm. Indeed. And like we said, there's just, you know, certain tweaks that you would do differently for audio versus gaming, but a lot of it is the same. You're playing the same game of, you know, trying to tweak the machine for certain performance characters. Yeah, and typically with the audio machine, uh, CPU tends to be like the first thing you're focused on and then RAM being, you know, the mm -hmm. how much of it you have. And that's generally where he starts. But there, there's some interesting uh, uh, debate because I actually went through the comments on this one um, after watching mm -hmm. the video. And there's a few uh, 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 techies in there who, you know, had some quarrels as to his recommendations. He tries to push the i7 and the i9 CPU, you know, um, mm -hmm. and right. some of them felt like uh, he wasn't giving enough credit to the i5 because these modern i5s mm -hmm. they they have more cores and um mm -hmm. they really are m more powerful than you know the i5s that we knew of a few years ago so there's mm -hmm. some truth to what they're saying that you can um you can get a lot of bang for less buck by going with the i5s but they're, they're also ignoring one of the the like future proof kind of considerations when you're buying hardware that you don't mm -hmm. try to save money on something that you'll end up having to spend in a few years to replace rather than try to get something right. that can go the the long haul and i would right. still recommend to somebody not to go with an i5 even if the i5 can perform better these days i would still say shoot for the i9 if possible and and settle with the i7 because that's where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck the question does come down to uh, when it comes to you know if you're doing gaming, for example, it's all about performance, then, you know, the frame rates and how things are going to go when the machine's under stress and all that kind of thing, where um, for those, you know, it could be that the i7 is the sweet spot that you're looking yeah. for. And like, I know what you're saying with the i5s because the machine I'm using now is an i5, but it's a fourth gen or something. It's, it's ancient. I've had this forever, but 
the newest i5s, like you're saying, they're way, way better. But I still, to me, when I'm going to go jump in and get a new machine, that new machine is going to be like going from a, you know, a Pinto to a Ferrari. Like it's going to be, it should be a major jump. And for me, going from an i5 to an i5 just feels like a sideways yeah. move, even though I'm sure the performance would be amazing compared to what, well, this, it, what I'm getting at. If, if right you're now. going, say, from your fourth gen, I, my i5 is like a, an 11th gen. So I was, in, I was yeah. impressed <laughs> with this i5. At first, when I started using it, I thought it was an i7. Like <laughs> from the the performance I was getting, um, I had to go and check, and I was like, "Wow, it is an i5 because it and definitely handled more than the other i5 I have behind it, <laughs> which is also mm -hmm. important. and it always comes back to it always comes back to Jason sometimes, but the. the uh, when watching him and seeing how many tabs he had open at first and then watching that he was still able to do things in a doll with that many tabs open i was like what the hell kind of computer are you using <laughs> and it's like it was that much you know it was a, i think it was a seven but it was a newest you know generation seven at the time compared to my you know dinosaur of a five just looked like such a performance increase yeah i crazy. think his is a 12th gen if i remember I yeah, think it yeah. Was, yeah and and a hey, those 12th gens i'm the, the 13th are even better but the, the 12th gens mm -hmm really impressed anything above 10 uh the 10th gen they started getting into their stride there with uh, um optimizing them so you can't go wrong within like an i7 10th gen or ab above you're you're in the modern uh, uh cpu space if if that's what you're looking at right and that would be the thing is if you had an i5 of that generation, you know, how many years would it be before you would feel like you really need to do an upgrade to something like a 7 uh, or, nine or 11, whatever. Three to four that. years, I think you could squeeze out of it. Mm hmm. Because I've already gotten a lot of years. I mean, this is a fourth gen, so I've gotten a lot of years out of this one already. When when I built it, it was, you know, top of the line gaming rig at the time. Like that was, you know, everything was top notch. And again, stuff ages quickly in this, in this, you know, in this well, game. Th things, <laughs> but, things are changing when it comes to processing a lot of it's being offloaded to the cloud um you know with ai uh you're starting to see like specialized processors just for dealing with ai um whether these i5s and i7s get more shelf life because they have less work to do it's possible you could get another decade out of it yeah Exactly. Especially, you know, they figure out new ways to solve the problems with the hardware. The, that the we big have. key is the operating systems, because if Apple and Microsoft have their way, they will force you to buy new hardware by bloating up the next version of any operating system. That's usually what forced me to have to keep up is the operating systems mm -hmm. got more and more demanding. Yeah, it's true. And again, that's what we were talking about with that forced obsolescence. You know, sometimes that's just, you know, you would have such so much more of a headache trying to stay on top of, you know, patching and working with the old software when they're this many generations further ahead. So it's like at some point it, they do have to just, you know, do a cutoff and say, okay, that's going to leave it there and then we're going to move well, on. Well, and imagine this. if people did to their computers what they do with their phones and, and just go back to the store every like year, two years and trade in and get a new one and it, if we did that with computers and we let we let the companies actually build the boxes, the devices and configure them and just give you a new optimized one every couple of years, some people probably would go that route. Not not me, yeah, I mean, but that's kind of what they were getting to. <laughs> kind of what they were getting to with you know playstations and xboxes and things of that nature like the, the the one box that now it's here you just get this and now every couple of years like you said you, you go to the next one you go to the next one you just keep upgrading to the next one but the hardware is all you know ideally it's all the same you know so you're you're you know doing stock car racing at that point where the machines are all identical so what's easier for them on the testing side they don't have to test for every possible combination of motherboard and processor and ram and whatever it's like oh you have that playstation 5 so you have this you know they know what you have and, and it takes a certain kind of user to be comfortable with letting letting the company configure the devices a, a user who's actually using different applications and making their own files is is more reluctant to let somebody else 
configure their devices and and toss it off to them they're gonna they're gonna want some control over their hardware and their setup whereas if you're just browsing and you're just using the device to read your email and lo log into facebook it doesn't matter what computer you're using they all can do that but like you said, you know, you know, it's not going to be a Linux user doing that because a Linux user is somebody who, you know, they do have a lot of interest in, you know, the inner workings of their machine. Like they get it, you know, programmed the way they want it. They they do all the, you know, all the inner workings. That's all part of what you got to do. Like you can't, you don't usually just see Linux just running as a, you know, as a shell and just do Linux users tend to take a lot of pride in being able to configure their own operating system from the ground up and, and, you know, exactly. staying off of the, uh, uh, the, corporate microsoft teat <laughs> like they they like to they like their independence and the freedom of the linux operating system i've i've been a linux guy uh i hell i was a red hat admin for a couple of years um in the corporate world mm -hmm. uh it's a great environment and operating system for certain things if i was just a browser and i just wanted to use it for those things ubuntu is awesome yeah yep but but yeah, yeah. Demo that a, as a music mm -hmm. machine um i i've tried a couple of times in the past to like build a linux music workbox never was compelled enough to use it I built it, <laughs> but um, couldn't find much use for it specifically because of the VSTs. Mm -hmm. Revisiting yeah. and that would be the key. Revisiting it now and seeing how how it is in twenty twenty four, it's going to be interesting. It, um, it, things mm -hmm. have changed, so I, I'm curious to see if maybe I can can find some use for it as a as a MIDI sequencer and and for other things where. If you're if you're sure. not trying to do full blown music production and you don't need all those VSTs, if you can build a box for free and you do have a killer audio recorder and, and a MIDI sequencer. Mm -hmm. And then you could be one of the few people who has you know a Windows box, a Mac, and a Linux box all in the same environment hey, doing stuff. I'm <laughs> one of those guys. <laughs> They're, they are rare for sure. <laughs> so let's take a look at what Slick Audio suggests here for uh, building a music machine. And that same machine could work good for gaming, could also work good for mm -hmm. what we're doing here. Running virtual machines is a little more demanding than like your typical computer use. So virtual machines, you, you want to have a lot of RAM because you have to yeah. allocate RAM to the virtual machine. So I have 32 gigs on, on this box i gave that virtual machine eight gigs so eight gigs gets allocated to it and when i turn that machine on it uses that eight gigs of ram to to run its version of windows now you could use you know up to you know almost all of it right like if you wanted to max out what you could use you, in the you can machine. but you shouldn't because if you use up all your resources on the virtual machine when you turn it on you're going to choke your physical machine and if you choke your physical exactly. machine it won't matter if those resources are there on the virtual machine the virtual machine will run like crap because the physical machine's running like crap that's why you got to leave enough resources behind, so to speak, to, to run the virtual, the, the main box while you're doing the virtual. Yeah, so stuff. you, and, and you don't really need to allocate. Uh, with virtual machines, they're much more efficient. So you will get better performance just assigning like two CPUs or one CPU and two cores and, you know, eight gigs of RAM. That machine will actually run more efficiently with Windows than, say, a laptop with the same settings. A, a physical mm -hmm, machine sure. won't run as efficiently as the virtual machine with the same resources. And the virtual machine being that, you know, it's just, you know, we install it right now. We could snapshot it. We could just bring it right back to that state. You know, things like that definitely help because you don't get all that bloat that you would normally have in your machine after running it day after day for yep. years. You know, when you're doing a virtual machine, a lot of times it's just you do your thing and that's the thing it's focused and on. And that's another cool thing with the virtual machines, being able to snapshot. So, you know, you went and you set up all this stuff. You did the Windows updates. You got your computer to a nice place make a snapshot 
doesn't take a lot of space and that snapshot you can revert back to because if if tomorrow you go try out some things uh you do a windows update and everything gets screwed up revert back mm -hmm. to the snapshot from yesterday and boom you're you're back in business it, it, it's a time exactly. saver yeah for sure so let's check yeah, it out. Slick Audio and Audio University going to show us how to build a music box. All right. For your first or your next audio production computer, we've got Jim Slick from Slick Audio, who's going to help us walk through the most important specs that you should keep in mind so that you get a powerful enough computer for music production. Let's, let's talk about processors. There's always been the misnomer that more cores is better. More cores typically means that there's going to be more heat generated, and therefore you can't clock them as fast, you can't run them as fast. So even natively, processors that have more cores will clock lower. So that simply means that every single core, individual core, is running slower than it would a processor with less cores. If you were looking to do super high performance, low latency audio, you're far better off, in my opinion, with less cores and have them be as fast as you can get them. If you are a, a mixed down engineer and you don't have to worry about uh, virtual instruments and you know round trip latency time, then that's a different story. Now, now more cores could be a better thing. Are there any differences that we should be aware of between i7s, i9s, i5s? Well, i5 definitely budget. Um, and i7 and i9 is pretty much where you want to keep your your focus uh you know for audio production and not that a five wouldn't work you know if you're only doing a couple of tracks here and there that sort of thing five would probably work fine good processor um you can overclock it when you jump to the i7 you're going to get pretty significant boost in, in the audio world and when you go to the i9 of course then that's the king right now you also have to look at ram right random access memory so a beginner intro small recording stuff 16 gig is probably sufficient. I certainly wouldn't do any less than that. I think it is extremely important if you can afford to jump it to 32 gig, do it. Uh, even if you're not using it when you first start, you'll end up using it at some point in time. Uh, plugins can be very RAM intensive. VSTIs can be very RAM intensive at times. And of course, you know, going to 64 gig, uh, depending on how many plugins you're running and how intense <laughs> your recording sessions become and and it's playback as well as you know record because think about it when you're doing overdubs right you're playing back and and a lot of people put the effects and this and that and you know you've got all kinds of plugins running so the more memory is never going to hurt again 16 bare minimum 32 gig is pretty much the sweet spot for most people um, when you do a little bit more intense stuff 64 and the extreme is 128 gig going past that is just ridiculous there i've stressed my machine with literally over 2000 tracks and i was hitting like the 96 98 gig uh of memory usage range which is still pretty nasty but 2000 tracks really you've got to look at it and just know what your sessions are going to be like and you know if you're going to add more tracks all right well then you know you have to upgrade and put more memory in there are typically three drives that should be in, in any given system that if you're looking for performance and, and first one obviously is your operating system and on that operating system drive um, you're also going to have your program so your your DAW your you know majority of your plugins are going to reside there then we usually recommend the second drive for samples that should be the fastest drive by the way because that's the one that's pulling samples from uh, virtual instruments now if you're if you don't use virtual instruments then you don't don't need that drive. And then the third drive, obviously, is where you're going to store your, your project files, right? It's where you're going to record your audio to. So that needs to be fast, but believe it or not, it can be the slowest and that's okay. Let's generically talk about the types of drives. The old platter drives were those big three and a half inch monsters and had platters spinning in them. Then we have uh, SSDs. There's no moving parts in it. So therefore it is not susceptible to drops and, you know, and all that kind of fun stuff. And they can be fast. Generically SSD to me means that it falls into the SATA interface, SATA interface. Now there's also an SSD called an NVMe and that actually connects directly to the PCIe bus. So the difference between those two types of drives 
even though the actual technology inside of them is about the same, the SATA drives every time that you do a read and write operation, it's going through the SATA bus on the computer, whereas the NVMe is actually writing on the PCIe bus of the computer, which is way, 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 way faster. That being said, there are some ups and downs and, and trips with that. There's only so much bandwidth that's on the PCIe bus. Once you start exceeding that, now, now you've got another bottleneck. The reality of it is, is NVMe is phenomenal for a boot drive, uh, for like your operating system, but it's not the end all be all. Um, when we run our big systems, um, we actually rarely will put an NVMe in there. We'll use uh, the two and a half inch SSDs, believe it or not. And uh, we have phenomenal performance when recording audio, you know, in my opinion now, you should be looking at, at, at SSDs, you know, across the board um, or NVMe as, as an alternative. As far as size is concerned for each of them, uh, OS drive, minimum of one terabyte, in my opinion, uh, and two terabyte is kind of the sweet spot. The operating system obviously is going to grow a little bit over time with patches and this and that and the other thing, but you're also going to be upgrading and, you know, adding plugins and adding programs and upgrading your DAW and that kind of stuff. And that just little by little, you know, through cr data creep will will consume more and more space. You're better off having, you know, too much than too little, because once you hit too little, you're reformatting and putting a bigger drive in, and then you have a lot of work to do. Uh, sample drive, um, I would do no less than two terabyte across the board, just because samples are huge. And, and if you can do bigger than that, do bigger than that. That comes back down then to the audio drive or the data drive, right? And there is a, a case where I've seen a lot of people do external drives um, as opposed to internal drives, that, that is not desirable. External drives are phenomenal for backup. Uh, they're not very good just because you're bottlenecked by the speed. Your performance is best served by keeping the drives internal. And again, as far as size is concerned, you're better off having more than less. If it were me, I have four terabyte drives in mine, SSDs. And that way I have plenty of room to do my tracking and, and do whatever the heck I want to do. And then as projects get old, then I can archive them off and I archive mine off to a network server, but that's when you archive them off to USB drive. Most people I'm sure could deal with two terabytes without a problem, you know, even one terabyte in certain instances if you're just doing tiny little projects and, and for themselves only. Uh, but if you're doing a lot of work and, and you know, experiment a lot, a lot of stuff, then, uh, you know, maybe you should consider four. You can absolutely do this on a single drive. Just if you're doing it on a single drive, I would definitely make sure it's an SSD uh, at minimum or an NVMe if you can. What are some other considerations we should keep in mind if we're considering a laptop rather than a desktop? Chances are, if you need portability, you're going to sacrifice some performance. That's all there is to it. That doesn't mean the machine won't run well. And I'm not saying that at all, but a desktop is going to run rings around it every time. And that's just the nature of the beast. Um, and again, it doesn't mean you can't work on the one, but what are your needs? That, that's the real key. You've got to do due diligence and, and think about what your workflow is going to be like. How many instruments are you going to be recording at a time and, and all that? Because that may make the decision on the portability for you, right? So if, you know, geez, I want to record the whole band. Well, you can do that. You absolutely could do that on a laptop without a problem. You know, assuming that you're going to have 16 inputs, you know, maybe 24 inputs, you get past that, you're, you're going to get into trouble, you know, with, uh, with a laptop. You just will. I'm not saying it's impossible. You, you can do it. There's always exceptions to the rule. I mean, I know a lot of our laptops can crank through that without a problem at all. But, you know, on the super low end side of our laptops, I'd be like, hmm, I'm not sure that's the right fit. But again to each his own. Everybody's needs are different. One thing that goes hand in hand with a laptop or desktop is the IO or the inputs and outputs that are on that machine. You know, the laptops today will take care of the majority of IO that you need. The only thing that you can't do is, is PCIe, right? You can do A over E, audio over ethernet. You can do USB of any, just about any flavor. Um, and then, of course, you have Thunderbolt. The, the only thing that the desktop is going to give you besides more speed, right, across the board, uh, it also then gives you that ability to run, you know, PCIe cards uh, as well. We've tried our best to make a one-size-fits-all explanation for everybody, but the truth is, I mean, there isn't one. What you really need to do is find either a mentor or a company like Slick that you can reach out to and get consultation before you purchase a computer from that company. 
for the length of time that you expect to own the machine, you've got to think about some degree of growth. Don't buy a machine that just barely squeezes into today because you're forgetting about tomorrow um, plan. And uh, so, yeah, there's no one size fits all. Everybody's needs are going to be a little bit different than the next. And, uh, and that's okay. Talk to people that, that know what they're doing, that have made the mistake before, that have tripped over these, you know, landmines, so to speak. Why make the same mistake twice? That's crazy. Ah. And it's about future proofing. Future proofing. Jim Slick, I agree actually pretty much with all his advice, um, especially on the hard drive side. You know, uh, the mm -hmm. NVMEs that he's talking about, this new machine, mm -hmm. uh, I finally got a chance to try one out. And, you know, it's it's a hard drive that looks like a RAM stick. <laughs> it's it, yep. very, right on the it's board. very unusual. And, uh, it's interesting what he says about like, you know, with the PCI bus and um, it's true. You can use it up uh, if, if you are going to use, you know, a GPU and graphics cards also on that bus, it may not be as efficient as, as an SSD SATA based solution in, in that case. Or using both, like you were saying, you know, having a, a mix or, you know, have different things going on. Like, you know, the focus would be the you know, the operating system, like you were saying, you know, broke it all down, like having that fast one right at the beginning. Then you have your drive where you're actually doing, you know, your samples pulling from, which, and when he started talking about external drives, I was sitting there wagging my finger at you because <laughs> I was like, you and your external Well, and, and, and he did make a point to say, like, you know, those are good for archiving. Like, you know, uh, an external drive is nice, especially if you have multiple computers where, you, you need to pull data off of that computer, store it on something, plug that drive into a different computer, use that data. Um, external drives still serve a good purpose. But on a music machine, um, I like his recommendation of three drives. That's actually the way to carve it up. Your system drive, mine's on an NVMe. Uh, I wish it was a terabyte. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's only 512 uh, gigs. But that's enough for what I need for a boot up drive for to install my my music programs and all that still has plenty of space. What I did for storage was 12 terabytes <laughs> and that's plenty of space for what he mentioned, like, you know, sample drives. Um, and you said that's still internal as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I use an internal uh, a platter based 12 terabyte. It, it, through the military discount that my brother got, I got it for forty dollars. So could nice. not like beat that price for twelve terabytes, <laughs> and and uh, and it's more than enough space to hold like you know all the different sample libraries. Halion takes up thirty gigs. Uh, Easy Drummer, the library is like um, twenty gigs. So it, it's true as you start to yeah, yeah as you start to install vsts start to use samples and things like that you do need to have a content drive and that content drive is gonna blow up quick yep and exactly. if you can throw an ssd into that mix like i got the mvme on my boot up i got my 12 terabyte platter for holding my samples if i could throw an ssd in there nice like two two terabyte SSD, um, I would use that as well for offloading, for loading the samples and things of that nature, because you get the benefits of the SSD speed on top of it. And when you're in work mode, you want to be loading things as fast as possible. Now, even as old as this machine is, I was saying, you know, this is an i5, you know, fourth gen that I've had forever. But when I when I first got it, I got it with a, um, I think it was only a 150 gig um, SSD as the as the boot drive. So I, I shifted that over once I got a 500 or 450 that is now the the system drive. Uh, I put that 150 and made that my you know whatever my primary game was that I was going to be playing at the time. I would put on that drive. So I would have the you know that as a secondary drive and then have the uh, operating system over here. But again, it didn't have enough room for growth. So then I had a platter that was only a terabyte at the time. And then the external that was two terabyte that I was using to, to you know, like you said, to back things up, not as a, you know, 
constantly accessing drive but just as something to you know dump stuff there when it's time to dump stuff there and that's the and if you were if you are building up. a hybrid music gaming machine those games are going to eat up your hard drive space way faster than the music's going to <laughs> For sure. A absolutely. And again, with that, you're also trying to balance, you know, uh, again, both both you're looking for good processor, both you're looking for good amounts of RAM and as much hard drive as you can get. And that's where everything is a matter of fitting everything under the price point that you're looking to build, you know, to spend on the machine as the upgrade. In my case, you know, this machine has served me very well for a long time, it, you know, even with the RTX card, which, you know, right now is having an issue, but that's why it's time to, to do an upgrade. But you know, in the meantime, at least the machine is still, you know, functioning, getting me through what I need to be doing. I'll tell you, time. if you're now is a good time to actually, if you do need to upgrade your, your, your NVIDIA cards, the RTX, the prices are dropping. My brother just got a 4090 uh, through that military. I mean, this is a $2,000 video card. He got it for 400 yeah. <laughs> He, nice, he had nice. 400 still pretty steep for what I'm doing. Right well, now, he had, I mean, he I'd had to, to double check that the price was for real and, um, mm -hmm. they only had two in stock. So like he ran <laughs> to the store. Give me two, you saw, give me two. <laughs> well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't sell him both, but they did let him, they let him get <laughs> <Yeah>. one. <laughs> mm hmm uh, and, and all, all the all, all the 3000 series all, all the other ones are going through a price shift right now so you know it, it it's not a bad time to to if you're getting into the rtx series of um nvidia cards they're actually starting to get within reach of some of us when we had talked a few months ago though we were talking about the fact that like going from an 8 gig card to a 12 or to a 16 wasn't the jump that it seemed like it would be because they weren't like if you went performance wise and you looked you would see that there was almost no change going from you know an 8 to a 16 for example because they're not fully utilizing the 16 in those cards so like at that time it was a weird time to get in so it was more wait and see how it all shakes out and then once they start you know properly utilizing the, the full bandwidth of the memory i think is the yeah, main and, issue, uh, to be able to take advantage of the nvidia was doing some fancy uh, uh shuffling during that, those those twelve gig cards, they were basically uh, uh, closing out some of the other ports and and speed options and upping the RAM, and it didn't make for uh, uh, more efficient. It didn't make for a fa faster like card. They, it's like they moved the bottleneck from over here yeah. to over there, but they're still. And, and <laughs> in their minds, they were probably thinking, "Oh." People are going to be happier buying a card that says it's got 12 gigs and, you know, ignoring the the foundation of the card and how it actually speaks to the yes. computer. <laughs> I mean, I, I almost did. I almost jumped in and grabbed the 12 or 16. I think it was the first 16 that I saw that was in a reasonable price range. But then uh, my buddy was, you know, doing some research on it. And he was, he went, he went down the rabbit hole and went through all the forums and all that, talking about the, uh, you know, the fact that going from the eight to the 16 essentially was like taking an eight and just slapping an extra eight on there, but it's not actually utilizing it any better or more efficiently. The the performance benefit was not there at the time. So I'm sure they've been working on it. Yeah, well, that. you're better off that you waited. Uh, I think now it's hitting the sweet spot for, for good deals. So mm -hmm. that was at Audio University over on YouTube, a site that we have cool. visited several times for good knowledge on audio production. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, and here's another one that we've visited a few times for hardware reviews, because he's got some of the best ones. Um, Sanjay C, he's got one of those radio voices like you. <laughs> uh, very, nice, and, very nice. And like I said, I mean, he, oh, he's got the Archer here, Key Lab review. Nah. Gonna be going to, this is, that's a board that, that's in my wish list. <laughs> Very nice. And, and you know, I got to check out his Top Gear for 2024. I mean, it's still early in 2024, but, you know, um, there is some cool new gear that's come out in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. And he's nice. over at Sanjay C on YouTube. And um, he had to build a music production, a PC music production studio which i i think he's generally used to dealing with the apple side um so this is something that's a little newer for him but uh for me <laughs> it's right at home <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and yeah right where what i was curious is what he chose you know what he what he chose for the different pieces based on what we just learned from the last video uh how mm -hmm. a music producer especially someone who does a lot of audio gear reviews and probably going to be plugging a lot of that gear into something like this to test it out um what would sure. he go with and uh he made some pretty nice choices here. Nice. Oh, let's check it out. On music production PC. I'll show you everything I put into this custom PC and how well it performs in a music studio setup. And maybe I'll do a little gaming on it as well. Now, this video is not meant to be a build it like me type of video, but I will share all the components I use. So if you wanna build your own and I'll share my real world tests of how it performed with music production, my DAW, plugins, and even gaming. Now I'm building this PC for several reasons. I feature a lot of software and plugins on my channel and I've never had a PC to test them on. Every now and then I get a comment from one of you asking about PC performance or compatibility, and now I'll have a PC to test it. On. I also want to test something else, audio plugins that run on the graphics card. GPU Audio is a company building audio plugins that run on a graphics card inside a computer instead of the CPU. This should allow us to run many more plugins or much more advanced plugins without running out of CPU power. We're going to test that later in this video. If you want to try out the free GPU Audio plugins, I'll put a link to them in the description below. Oh, this case that you saw me unbox is the Thermaltake View 200 case. Uh, Thermaltake cases are pretty standard standard, easy to find, reasonably priced, and I really like this white color, so I'm going to try to make the other things on the desktop white as well. This is the ASUS ProArt B550 motherboard. It's actually a generation old, but it's a proven workhorse, good for photo editing, video editing, so it should be good for music production too. Thunderbolt is incorporated into this motherboard, which will make running Thunderbolt devices more stable. The processor I got is a Ryzen 5950. It's a 16 core processor. This is the entry level to the Ryzen 9. You can go for a seven and save about $250 and still be fine. The number of cores impacts the number of plugins you can run at once. Of course, we're going to try to run GPU audio plugins on the graphics card later as well. We'll see how that goes. For RAM, I'm using the G-Skill Trident Neo series. This is 64 gigabytes of RAM. G-Skill offers a good value too, fast timing, lower latency. AMD processors are better with lower latency RAM. For the SSD, I've chosen a Samsung 990 Pro series. This is a Gen 4 and does two gigabytes per lane and connects by four. So eight gigabytes theoretical max throughput. It's got a high read write speed and this should make loading sample virtual instruments pretty fast. Now, I wanted to keep this PC build at a reasonable price, but still good enough for gaming. So this is neither the most budget PC nor the most tricked out PC you could build. But with the components I've chosen, I'm hoping this will be excellent for music production and good enough for gaming. This is the Noctua NH-U12A CPU cooler. It's massive. I don't think it's even gonna fit in here. This is one of the quietest performing coolers on the market, and that's gonna be really important for studio recording, right? I've heard that it performs as well as an all-in-one water-cooled setup. The noise level is 22.6 decibels. Hey, I turned this into a claw machine. Here you go. So you know, the first PC I ever purchased for music production was actually from Circuit City. If anyone remembers Circuit City. Push it, click it, press it, click it, tune it in, turn it on. This is what you watch it on. Any way you work it, integrate your circuit at the city. Circuit City. It was an IBM and I was running Logic back when it was with eMagic. If you remember Logic back when it was with eMagic, hit the like button. Next up is the power supply. This is the Thermaltake 850 watt power supply. It's probably more than this computer needs, but it 
kind of leaves room for upgrading later. Now here's what's even crazier. When I first got started with music production, that was on a four track tape recorder, which my band rented. It just had four tracks on it. So we could only record four tracks. We'd have to bounce to do more than that. Let's talk about the video card. The main processor doesn't have an integrated GPU, so GPU Audio sent me the NVIDIA 3080. You can actually buy any GPU for music production. Even older ones may be fine. NVIDIA is the king of graphics cards, so we should have excellent graphics on this. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, hit the subscribe button and you can support my work here by getting one of my virtual instruments or sample packs that could inspire your next song. A link to my shop and free downloads is below. All right, we're just gonna power on this thing and hopefully it works. Everything is set. Hey! Here it is, the final build. I wanna share some tests I did with this PC with my DAW, plugins, GPU audio, and even gaming. But before I do, let's build a little studio. I've put together a small setup using some white gear to match the white case I chose for this PC. The keyboard and mouse are by Logitech. This is the Logitech MX Keys Mini, the same keyboard I use every day at my usual studio desk. I've paired it with the Logitech Lift mouse, which I've always wanted to try, and I have to say feels more comfortable because of its vertical orientation. The monitor is by Samsung, and it's probably the first thing I'm going to upgrade. Given the gaming performance, which we'll look at in a second, I could really go with a much more premium monitor. But this was very inexpensive and still looks pleasant. For the studio gear, I chose the Arturia Mini Fuse for the interface and the Mini Lab for my keyboard. Both great devices for home music production, but more importantly, they come in white. The speakers are by Kali Audio. These are the IN5 studio monitors by Kali, and they're an excellent bang for your buck for your studio. Definitely loud enough for this setup and very nice for mixing. The headphones are by Audio-Technica. These are the M20X headphones, which have great sound for the price. The white is the Bluetooth version. The desk itself is a 55 inch folding desk by need. It's $150 and I've used it time and time again for many videos. Definitely got my money's worth with it, but I'd recommend getting the 62 inch version to add a bit more space for your setup. All right, so how does the PC perform? The startup is very fast thanks to the SSD. I loaded up Ableton Live and it was really hard to push it to its limits. I'm running Ableton Live version 11 suite. I loaded Native Instruments, Ashlight in Contact, Omnisphere, some Arturia instruments, and it performed with zero lag. I mean, the CPU usage is very low. Next, just to test it out, I added 60 contact instruments and played them together, and I was able to stay below the overload threshold in Ableton Live. Pretty good, this PC is doing really well. Let's try some more effects from GPU audio and we'll monitor the GPU usage. Remember, these are special plugins that use your graphics card instead of your CPU. So you can use many more plugins or more complex plugins without running out of CPU power. I even added GPU audio plugins to the project that has 60 contact instruments and GP audio plugins kept going and going and the graphics card handled all the processing. No added strain on the CPU. GPU audio plugins will work with most DAWs and their plugin suite is coming to Apple very soon. You can download their beta suite of plugins for free right now. They've got some effects plugins now and they're coming out with a GPU powered synth later this year. GPU audio is also partnering with Vienna Symphonic Library for a new plugin to be released. MIR Pro 3D will feature GPU acceleration and it's gonna be the first of many to adopt this type of technology. When you download their free plugins, you'll get 50 impulse responses free as well. You can find all their free stuff on their downloads page. I'll add a link below. So how about gaming? I ran the benchmark setup on Forza Horizon 5. The setup identified my best settings as extreme. So yeah, this can handle some pretty intense gaming. But I think again, my weakest link in this setup is the monitor. A 4K monitor capable of 120 frames per second would be ideal. So how about fan noise? There are several fans in this build, including the front ones, the CPU fan, the graphics card fan, and there's one in the power supply as well. 
Running Ableton Live, the fans were pretty low in volume. I used the Decibel X app on my iPhone and measured an increase of about 10 decibels of fan noise compared to silence when running Ableton Live with a moderately sized project and a bunch of effects. With this setup, I can also control the fan speed if I need real silence. Keep in mind placement of your PC will also impact noise. I'm very happy with the noise level and extremely happy with the performance. In fact, when it comes to performance, this PC gets close to my MacBook M1 Max computer. While my Mac was faster with several tests I ran, overall, I'm very happy with the new PC I built. So how much did this custom PC build cost? At the time of this posting, the total price is $1,400 without the NVIDIA 3080 graphics card. With it, the price would currently be around $2,130. But of course, you can spend a lot less on a graphics card and still have an excellent music production PC. Now, the price of these components change frequently, so check the links below for the current prices. What would I recommend? You don't need the NVIDIA 3080 in your setup. You can use the GPU audio plugins with other graphics cards. In fact, you can download their free plugins and try them with your current setup as well. So there you go, that's my PC build. I'll be using this in more videos so you'll see it in action a lot more on my channel. I've linked all the parts I used for this build in the video description below. Now that we have a PC, how do you build a music studio at home? Watch my most popular video next on how to build a studio Studio at home, everything you need to start making music. Thanks to GPU Audio for providing the video card and those free plugins. I'll see you soon for another video on home music production. Until then, keep making the music you love. Bye. Oh, that's why I love Sanjay's reviews. I mean, he covered decibel levels <laughs> of the fan, the desk. It, and it's a sweet setup. I mean, that's a good looking machine, a good looking desk setup. Yep. Like the whole setup. Uh, he, he doesn't ignore anything in, in a build. And in the case of his equipment choices here, um, well, he's playing with the Ryzen 9, which is a very interesting processor. That's what that's what Rick's been playing with the last couple of months. Right, right. And and, and again, I love the concept using the graphics card for the uh, for the VSTs for the instruments. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I, for the I just brought up actually that that uh, GPU <laughs> GPU dot audio. Um, gonna be visiting the site. Might do a whole night <laughs> on it. Uh, definitely yeah. want to check out more of that. I think that's the future of VST plugins. Finding a new CPU, a new processing home for them. Mm -hmm. and like if they're doing synths and things of that nature that's where i'm eating up a lot of my cpu now I, I mean fortunately like this machine is handling everything i've had almost no burps mm -hmm. the few that i've had were usually other things not the equipment that was having the problem but mm -hmm. to be able to utilize i've got the same nvidia card he's got <laughs> and i'd love to see those in action with it yeah definitely solid yeah that that was what really drew me to that video i was like really there are gpu driven plugins out there cool sanjay mm -hmm. sh hook me up <laughs> right. let's check it out yeah <laughs> and, and he did like he did <laughs> that yeah. was at sanjay c over on YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, excellent channel. Very cool. Excellent channel for mm -hmm. reviews and, and information. And tell me he doesn't have that radio voice. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. It's like another it. Glenn. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so now that we've looked at some hardware uh, suggestions, you know, going back mm -hmm. to the virtual world, um, because these machines that they've talked about, they've talked about using them for music production. They've talked about using them for gaming. Um, these machines will also work really well for a, a virtual server, uh, a, a machine that you can run multiple operating systems under. And um, to be able to do that, you would want to understand what a virtual machine is and how it works. Um, and Chris Titus Tech is going to give us an explanation on, you know, 
what is a virtual machine? How does it work under a physical machine? That's at Chris Titus Tech, Freshy, and then a tech channel. Finally, we get some tech channels in here. <laughs> Gotta love the tech stuff. Yeah. And uh, he's going to explain virtualization uh, at, at the best I could find. Um, I mean, his goal with his channel is to simplify tech. And this is uh, some complicated tech. Um even advanced computer guys sometimes have a tough time wrapping their heads around virtualization, but mm -hmm. uh, this is a good explanation of how virtualization works and uh, how it ties into a physical box. Mm -hmm. Nice. Let's see what he's got here for virtualization explained. In this video, I'm going over virtualization. I will be specifically covering containers, type one hypervisors, type two hypervisors, and everything in between. So if you want to know everything about virtualization, stay tuned. So let's start out with type one hypervisors. I'm not gonna spend a lot of subject on this. My very first video I ever uploaded to YouTube was actually over type one hypervisors. And I go into a lengthy PowerPoint uh, actually, it wasn't that that lengthy. It was about six minutes. I'll link it up here. Um, the audio and video is not great on it, but there's still some good content in it. Uh, the short of it is this. Uh, type 1 hypervisors, uh, VMware, ESXi, uh, Citrix's Zen server, and Microsoft's um, Hyper-V. These things are your type 1 hypervisor or bare metal hypervisors. What that means is it doesn't actually function as a workstation on a type one hypervisor. These are meant to sit in server racks or in closets somewhere um, to where you're not actually physically sitting at them. They do have consoles, but usually it's just a terminal or a console screen to where there's no graphics or anything like that. And then all the virtual machines actually load up in them. You typically always control these from another location and almost every one of them is headless or operates in a headless environment, meaning you don't need a monitor or a keyboard and mouse attached to them. So that is type one. I'm not going to go into like these are mainly for businesses. If you're in a data center, they're everywhere. Most of them is ESXi based and VMware pretty much dominates this market. And rightfully so, it's a very good product and I don't have anything bad to say about them. Other than it's a little pricey, especially when you add in like high availability and other things, but um, that's neither here or there. So the second form of hypervisor is called a type two hypervisor. Typically these are run on a host which means if you have Linux or Windows or whatever it might be, you'd actually run these on top of your operating system. So you'd boot into Linux and then you'd boot into your hypervisor. Now this is gonna be VMware Workstation or uh, Boxes or QEMU or VirtualBox. I mean, there's a lot of them out there. Those are just some of the biggest ones. Um, my personal take on these is VMware Workstation is a very limited skill set for the free version you can load existing virtual machines but you can't modify them however it works the best out of the box meaning you install it run it and then just load your virtual machine and it loads every time on pretty much any hardware which is amazing my second one for ease of use would be virtualbox i think it's a lot easier to use than you know qemu but virtualbox kind of makes my number two list because it's a standalone and everything runs on VirtualBox fairly easily and it is completely uh, free and open source I believe and it's an Oracle uh, is the company parent company that's in charge of this product and it's been out for a long time so uh, I know VirtualBox quite well and also VMware. Now the third and probably the most prevalent that you see on forums are QEMU based hypervisors. So QEMU is actually kind of like the back end or all in one hypervisor. However, it runs on like config files and things like that. If you want an actual graphic user interface for QEMU, uh, you're typically using boxes or you're using vert manager. Um, these types of front ends 
make it so you can easily create virtual machines rather easily. Now, why I say it's the most prevalent that you hear about all the time is because most people are doing what's called PCIe pass-through. This is passing through an actual graphics card to the virtual machine natively. So where you blacklist this card, your computer boots up, doesn't see the card at all, the actual host operating system, but when you launch your virtual machine, the virtual machine connects to that card and then it works as if you were actually booted into Windows. So you see it all the time and it's really evolved over the last couple of years. I'm probably gonna um, take a graphics card from my secondary computer and actually demonstrate this. I just wanted to get it to a point to where it's more flushed out. Looking Glass is just starting to kind of come about and it's uh, kind of a obscure project but it's still very interesting to see level one text has some great video over looking glass and Wendell over there has done a fantastic job explaining it but uh, it is very technical and not for the faint of heart if you're not a technical person the chances of you doing a PCIe pass-through and getting that on a virtual machine is slim and none and I honestly guarantee you you're not gonna be able to do it easily following any guide just because you need to know quite a bit about Linux and how virtual machines work prior to attempting such a thing. So uh, that is type two and type one hypervisors condensed down. So now that you have a basic understanding of those hypervisors, there's some really oddball one that I just kind of wanted to go over. I couldn't really put this in a type two, but I couldn't really put it in a type one. It's more of a residential product, not really a business grade product, and it's called Unraid. You've seen this probably on Linus Tech Tips. They had a fantastic video actually that it was one box, two gaming PCs. And it was kind of neat to see. They stuck a box right in the middle and then put two monitors on each side and then created different virtual machines within this box to run two workstations off of one PC. Um, cool. <laughs> it's all I really got to say about that. There's not real much uh, real world application for this type of software. I think it runs like 60 or 70 bucks, so it's not expensive. And if it's something that you want to tinker around with, by all means, do it. I've actually downloaded the trial version of Unraid, installed it, messed around, and I figured out real quick, this really isn't for me because I have no interest of doing that. And it's not really that good of a hypervisor from a type one perspective and it's not really a type two to where i'm going to be doing other stuff on it so i was uh, kind of turned off by that entire thing but i still had to mention it because other people have mentioned on riot and i want to bring it up it's not something i'd ever recommend anyone learning or spending much time on because it's more of just a hobbyist uh, software title. I, I, I just don't have any other way to put it because of its classification here. But with that said, that's all your hypervisors. And now I wanted to get into something else, mainly called containers. Now, this is kind of the future of virtualization when it comes to containers. There is just such advancement going on in this realm to where many traditional servers are just being sunset. I've done this personally in business where I had one leftover server that had like an old line of business application on it and that's really all it was there for and uh, it's a waste of resources because that line of business really didn't use much resources. It did need a full VM. It did need a full operating system. It just was legacy software that I just had up and going. That's when containers kind of came in and the most, uh, the biggest container Software on the market is Docker or Docker Enterprise, depending on which one you choose, but definitely Docker would be the big one. The other one that I will mention is Red Hat's entry in this, and that's OpenShift uh, or Kubernetes. Uh, I probably botched the actual wording there, but Red Hat's version and then Docker. Uh, Red Hat is kind of starting to make a splash in this because it's a very powerful uh, way of doing like enterprise storage and containers. But um, it's still nothing I'm not familiar with. As one of the early adopters of containers, Docker is really what I learned on and what most businesses uh, transitioned to before kind of OpenShift and others really hit the market, at least in the business realm. I was not really in tune with the Linux scene at, when I was actually doing this and Docker was pretty much the only 
um, dog in the fight back then. So, with that said, Docker, amazing. What it is really is taking that application, putting it in a container, or it's called a container, and it's able to run basically on bare metal without any operating system. So, it's like wine for applications, but it doesn't need Linux or any operating system to run on. It, it's just a great thing because I can put this on a one server that runs these containers and literally install 10, 20 of these different containers running different operating systems without almost any overhead uh, compared to if I did a VM for each one which is incredible. So that's what containers are. That's why there's a bunch of uh, people saying, oh, containers are pretty much going to kill virtualization or kill hypervisors, which isn't true. There's always a place for hypervisors. But what it did do is it really helped cut down on the hardware costs. So the thing I haven't really mentioned is why virtualization? Why do people care about virtualization? And really the long story made short here is instead of having 20 physical computers in a rack i can have one computer i mean one physical box they call them hosts and these physical box can pretty much span uh 20 sometimes even more i mean there's some really really powerful hardware out there today that can just virtualize pretty much anything which is amazing so virtualization is basically what's called a physical to virtual or a p to v and that's taking these physical boxes and putting them into virtualized environments and over the past 10 years that's where everything has gone in the data center i can't remember the last time i saw a physical box that just had one server operating system without a hypervisor on it I mean, it's just so rare these days. Occasionally you get some of these old vets that say, hey, you have to run a domain controller, bare metal, physical only, no virtualization. And I'm not one of those. I I don't subscribe to that thought process. If you want to do that, fine. Dedicate a host to that one and just leave it there. But to not virtualize it, I think is a mistake. There's no risk, I think, going from a P to V. I like things virtualized. I find it a lot easier if there's a problem with that domain controller. I know I can reboot it easily and I don't have to drive to the data center to physically hard reset that computer if it were to lock up. If that uh, uh, container locks up, I can easily reboot it. I mean, there's so many benefits to having things virtualized that is just incredible for business. So in the past 10 years, everything moved from these physical servers to the virtual or the VMs. And then in the, really in the past couple years, you've seen more of a migration from VMs to containers to where if a VM was only being used for one or two applications and those can be put in containers, well, it, would, it just makes perfect sense to do that. You'd take them from that virtual machine, put them in a couple containers, throw that in your Docker instance, and you're good. And that's kind of where things are going in the business realm and virtualization. I kind of went over this a little fast, so you might need to re-watch this video, but uh, at the same time, it's really good knowledge because many people don't understand virtualization and they kind of try and pigeonhole everything into one bucket. And there's really multiple different facets of virtualization. And I hope that clears up a lot of things for you all. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and leave it here and let me know in the comments what you think. Did I miss anything? Is there anything as far as virtualization that you would have liked to see? I know I didn't actually show any clips here of the different virtualized environments, but there's just so much that goes into this and this being only like a 10 minute video, I'm, I like to go into each one of these virtualizations independently and kind of show them off and show the differences. But with that said, I'll see you on the next video. And that was the easiest video I could find on explaining virtualization. <laughs> sure. It is a complex topic, it, it, but I do like the, container, the containerized uh, portion of that. That's very cool. 
Yeah, actually, it's the containers that um, really got me interested because that's something that's a little newer to me. Um, I've been dealing with virtualization going back to like 2008, where we had to set up, you know, virtual data centers. And this was at the beginning of virtual virtualizing. And, you know, a lot of what he mentions there, it, it is more geared towards like the IT guy, the tech who has to set up like, you know, uh, uh, 20, 30 machines in a business. And whether you're using physical boxes or you're just using dummy terminals to connect to these virtual machines, the yeah. container definitely looks like it is the future of low resource virtualization. Um, that That's an interesting new arena it's almost like um, you were getting at with uh, you know going back towards like dumb terminals almost where you just have you know some you know minimal hardware at the desk but the the actual processing the actual you know horsepower is elsewhere in a server rack you know yeah. doing it that way and it's only being used you know a little bit at the time by you know different people all the time so it's better to you know balance that performance across everybody and allow everybody to access the resources you know as they need them and what's ironic is, you know, they, they tried to do this back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. you, you probably remember some of those like thin terminals and dummy terminals of the 90s. Mm -hmm. And the networks weren't um, the networks weren't ready for that technology. And that's kind of what slowed it down in the 90s. Mm -hmm. As we got into, you know, Ethernet and especially gigabit, um, the option of being able to bring up a machine across the network over on a, a little thin workstation became a reality. N now, mm -hmm. you could have a whole office working off of, you know, a server in the back room, and mm -hmm. each one has their own independent environment. Yep. Through the late 90s and 2000 to 2010, that whole time frame there, I, I was the guy, you know, or one of the guys that was putting out, you know, dozens of machines in a week. You know, we would basically, you know, we had a room where we had, you know, 100, 120, 150 machines because we had a very large um, building where it was, you know, building A, B, C, D, like buildings A through I were all connected by one main hallway. So it's almost like a military building where there's one hallway that was like literally a mile long that connected all these buildings together. And we had somewhere in the neighborhood of like 2000 plus users in that one building, uh, technically building, you know, but it's like all those in separate buildings. So we had to cover a lot of ground and we had to have a lot of machines at the ready. We were trying to keep something like 5% uh, available you know, on hand. And it was sometimes even you know, more than that. So that it was a high turnover or high, um, like the machines would have, not that they would have problems, but this was all high demand uh, because it was like investing. So yeah. they, they had, you know, the top of the line machines and if something went wrong, they wanted it fixed like immediately. So we would just have machines, you know, imaged, ready to go on the shelf and we would just bring it to a desk, you know, take their old machine out, put a new machine in, have them log in and starts pulling their profile and gets you know, everything coming down and we can take their machine away to work on it and see if we're going to get that back to them or get them, you know, everything they need from that machine onto the new one. But yeah. you know, doing dozens of machines at a time, you know, for, for years like that. And at one point, you know, having to run around that entire building because there was a, a virus going around that they had to like immediately get every machine to shut off. And if we were able to do it at the subnet level, we could have just been like, shut them all off, shut them all off, shut them all off. But it was okay. Go to go to all two thousand desks and hit the power button. It's like, wait, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, that, that. That, well, that's why a lot of companies started to jump on virtualization around that time. Because if you are dealing with that kind of situation where you got to isolate the network because there's a virus running around in it, mm -hmm. it's much easier to manage all that centrally on a server mm -hmm. than to go to each box and have to deal with them individually. For sure. And that was the time we were starting to use, uh, I want to say at that time, Dameware probably uh, for remote access uh, yeah. at the beginning. And I think we used a few different products over time. But um, you know, early, early days of trying remote control, it was things like NetMeeting I was using and things like Tivoli and things like that back in, I would say, the mid mid to late 90s um, are the things that we were starting to use for those kinds of things. Uh, Tivoli, I think, was from IBM at that time. Um, but a bunch of different you know ways of doing remote control, remote access. Um, do those kinds of things because that was a lot easier than having to go to the desks all the time. Like sometimes you have to go to the desk to swap a keyboard or see what the actual problem is. Oh, don't stack papers on that air vent. That's a bad thing. You know, like you have to go do things like that. But for the most part, if you could remote to the machine, you could do a lot of the support stuff that you needed to from, you know, without having to go there because then I'm um, just at my desk. I can remote into your machine, fix it. Somebody else can be calling me about something. I can remote into their machine and kick something off there. Like you can do a lot more 
where you're sitting in one place and remoting to all these other places to do the stuff you need to do. Yeah, that's what I did for a decade. And and I started with that uh, like uh, level one virtualization that he mentioned where mm -hmm. we were carving it out for, you know, the employees. But mm -hmm. that level two um, is what as a programmer and, you know, as, a, as the guy who had to test things, test software, mm -hmm. um, try code in different environments, mm -hmm. being able to virtualize on a workstation became, you know, my thing because I had to test at that time. I had to test Windows 7, Windows mm -hmm. 8 as it was destroying things and then <laughs> Windows 10. So, um the the workstation virtualization that he mentions there if you're a developer or or you do want to test things and you've only got like one box to to work with being able to put these different operating systems under an isolated workstation gets to be real useful the one we have here our, our daw machine um what we're using there is this product, you know, from VMware, he mentioned VMware has been the king at certain aspects of virtualization since the very beginning. Yep. Um, they're, they're my go-to mm -hmm. and even for free, uh, this workstation player, it's free yep. and it's a good way to get started. Uh, virtual box, another one he mentioned, mm -hmm. either one of those you can get for free. Get your hands on a Windows install ISO. And if you didn't know, like Microsoft does actually put the installers out there and they give you, uh, I think it's 180 days. 180 days, like that Windows will work without a license. So th that's more than enough time to test out something in Windows and, and do what you need to. And 180 days later, you can put a new copy on it. That's a nice legal way to try things out in, in the Windows environment. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're using is actually the big brother to the, the Workstation player. The Workstation Pro is mm -hmm. what I've been using since 2008. What's mm -hmm. awesome with that is you can highly customize your virtual machines and you can build a lot of different operating systems that the player may not, not be as functional with so pro is nice if you are a programmer and you you need to test it out in windows 7 windows 10 windows 11 and you want to be able to jump between them run them all at the same time um the machines show up on my network there's a, a bridging option for the networking so those machines show up on my network like a physical machine mm -hmm. makes makes for network testing really good yeah yeah so if you do want to dabble with virtual machines, workstation player, you can't go wrong or VM uh, uh, virtual box. And if you run into any questions or anything, send me a message. And like, this is an area that been working in for almost 20 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. And, and if you got more questions on virtualization at Chris Titus tech, he's, mm -hmm definitely a good source for this i mean like i said i searched everywhere for explanations and this was the closest i found to digestible for the average user yeah i like the way he broke it down yep Solid. yeah good job chris mm -hmm. so now the whole purpose for why we jumped into virtualization tonight um mm -hmm. we're we're building a new talking sh it DAW box. And uh, I want to test out as many DAWs as I can get my hands on, actually, and really see them in action. I want to test them on Windows 10. And I don't want to test them on Windows 11, but I'm going to. Yeah, and, yeah. and as Windows 12 comes out, I'll definitely be seeing how they perform there. They, they should generally be the same. The one thing between uh, uh, 10 and 11 and what's going to be 12, not a lot's changing under the hood. The programs should function, work the same way. Uh, <laughs> the, the one exception, like 11 does handle the audio 
drivers a little mm-hmm. differently than 10. So that's part of the reason why I, I want to see if like my Roland and some of my audio hardware, how the drivers are going to play nice with the operating system. Because mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. audio, audio hardware does not always follow the new operating systems, uh, especially with like my keyboards. Um, mm-hmm. Getting a Windows 7 driver for this Roland piece of cake, that's the mm-hmm. operating system that was out. Right. Getting a Windows 10 driver for it, I had to actually take the Windows 7 driver and run a special patch mm-hmm. to change the, uh, you know, the the instruction file so that it would work under Windows 10. I had to turn off um, driver signature, you know, with right. Windows, with mm-hmm. Windows after Windows 7, they started to use uh, driver signature enforcement. So mm-hmm. if you just tried to install your hardware and your driver wasn't signed, which a lot mm-hmm. of these vendors don't want to pay the money to mm-hmm. get their driver signed, right? the driver doesn't necessarily work in the new version of Windows, even though it technically does. Mm-hmm. But the yep. vendor doesn't want to support it and... M- Microsoft doesn't want to do anything to update it. Apple's no better, you know, mm. uh, as the new versions of Apple come out, uh, almost every time I've updated an Apple operating system, the hardware program, the audio programs broke. Mm. And, and right. you had to wait until the vendor of the audio program made a new version compatible with the new Mac OS. So, mm-hmm. You do want to be able to test these things isolated before you go wiping your computer and saying, ah, I got the new Mac OS and nothing <laughs> works. <laughs> yeah. That's where also, um, to me, things like compatibility mode, like being able to go back and, you know, go into something on Windows 10, for example, and say compatibility mode, you know, use it as if it was Windows 7 and it tries to use that driver. Like sometimes you can get around some of those issues. Which with that. used to work, which, yeah. which worked better between 7 and 10. Then what I'm seeing, but definitely seven and eleven, not so much. But uh, seven and ten, you could kind of like hack ten to think like Windows seven. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Same thing when uh, XP, uh, as XP became Vista. <laughs> Vista was a hot mess, and running in XP compatibility mode was almost a necessity. You give me PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to, the next couple of videos, we're going to look at some different uh, uh, DAW suggestions. The first one is, is about the t- 10 best free DAWs. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I wanted to start with the free ones um, because if you're new, if you're new to making music, if you're coming from band lab and your first exposure was to like the band lab DAW, Band Lab is a great free dog. Um, yep. they, they don't mention it in, he, in here, but like that's a good starting point. It gets you comfortable mm-hmm. with working with a dog. Mm-hmm. When you want to start bringing those tracks to your computer and working locally, not in the cloud, um, these are some free options that you can take. And s- some of them may have paid upgrade options, mm-hmm. but they give you enough functionality free which is why i'm testing them i want to make sure that they're at least functional and that it's not just uh uh that that kind of situation where it's like oh we'll let you see the program but we won't let you use it yeah well like you're saying the demo mode on some of them where you can you know you can get in there you can try all stuff out but saving it using it to actually publish things you can't really do it that way you can yeah you know you can try the features out see what they're like but you're not going to get a production um level item out of it whereas something like reaper you can just go into you can just use it you know and and do what you're doing well and the nice thing with reaper is um you can you should pay for it if you do eventually use it because the only thing they do is put up a nag screen like Mm -hmm. right at the beginning they put up a Mm -hmm. nag screen and just make you wait you know so many seconds before the screen the pop-up goes away but it's fully functional so they, they don't give you a crippleware version. They give you a fully functional version and they just suggest to you that, you know, if you want support and uh, you, you don't want to have to wait in that opening screen, 
it's one of the cheapest options you'll find out there. I think it's sixty dollars for for the license, and compared to the other ones, which are in the hundreds, mm-hmm. they're they're the best choice for low price. Right. And, and they do like that kind of honor system, you know, Nagware kind of a thing, yeah. Yeah, and then they're they they they're not pushy about it. Like mm-hmm. so, some programs can get really pushy about like, like every five minutes upgrade. popping it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So here here's another freshy channel. Um, another great one. I'm glad I found uh, at Lander Music L A N D R Music, mm-hmm. and uh, we've got a lot of different types of videos here. Mm-hmm. Talks great. about Dawes vocal tricks so you might be back on a vocal night mm-hmm. yeah and what he's going to show us here is the 10 best free dawz in 2021 no 2024 <laughs> that's what it says in the title <laughs> right <laughs> but i happen to find that screen that says 2021 uh not much has changed though to to be fair from 2021 to 2024 uh most of these DAWs have been around mm-hmm. for that long. There, there, there's some nothing for I, yeah, there's nothing I, I see in this list that that is brand spanking new. Mm-hmm. Let's see what we got. Best free DAWs music production. Start making music now. On today, I'm going over the best free DAWs to get started in music production. I'll be going over all the features and limitations for each one, and all the links to download them are in the description. As a bonus, I'm going to have my good old buddy Johnny on a sessions call making a beat with each of these DAWs. You ready, Johnny? Yeah, let's do it. So first, I'll be going over the best free DAWs that are exclusive to one operating system like Windows or Mac. All right, you might have heard of this one before. It used to be called Sonar, made by a company called Cakewalk, but it's since changed names to Cakewalk and now is released under the company BandLab, which is actually a great online DAW in its own right. All right, Johnny, your time starts now. Cool. Cakewalk is one of the best free DAWs to get started with on Windows. It comes with four free virtual instruments, built-in effects, and a highly customizable interface. It supports unlimited tracks and VSTs, which means you can install all of your favorite free plugins. The only obvious limitation is that it's exclusive to Windows. If you're on Windows though, and you're looking for a free DAW, this is it. So yeah, Cakewalk, I found it was really easy to use, but the only thing I didn't like about it was like the built-in instruments on it. But the rest was pretty good. Next up is Apple. Now Logic is Apple's paid DAW, but if you're looking to get in for free, then GarageBand is the way to go. All right, Johnny, show me what you got. I got you. In GarageBand, you get access to a maximum of 255 tracks, which is more than enough to make great music. It comes with tons of instruments, effects, and built-in loops, which makes getting started a breeze. It also supports third-party plugins, so just like Cakewalk, you can install all your favorite VSTs. If you want to get into the nitty-gritty of audio production, you might find some friction with GarageBand. It doesn't have a full mixer, inspector, or auxiliary track for sends and returns that you'll find in Logic. That being said, it's a fully functional DAW that's capable of producing professional-sounding music. GarageBand really easy to use it's free comes with a lot of sounds the only thing that i think that's missing is a proper mixer like i like to mix things with proper faders on it like other daws but that's definitely a thing but it's free though so it's still good these next daws are completely free across multiple operating systems there are a few limitations for each of them but if you're just looking to get started they are great contenders for a fully functional free daw that being said if you're on windows or mac i highly recommend the ones that i just mentioned next Next up is LMMS, which is a 100% free, open source, community-driven project. This is a no-strings-attached free DAW with an amazing community behind it. It's definitely the most accessible, available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. All right, Johnny, you know the drill. Yeah! The layout and workflow of LMMS might look familiar if you've ever seen or used FL Studio before. Sequencing MIDI and loading up your favorite free plugins is super easy, and it comes with a ton of virtual instruments, effects, and samples. This leads to an honorable mention for Audacity, which is a free DAW that only works with audio. By pairing these two together, you'll basically have full functionality, but with the inconvenience of switching between software. 
depending on what you're making. So this one's a really good alternative to FL Studio if you want to get into that workflow. I'm personally not a fan of the UI. And the thing that I don't like is that you can't record audio in. So like if you're sampling or want to plug in a guitar, you can't really do that. But overall, it's like, it's, it's not bad. Next up is Traction Waveform. Traction Waveform Free is the free counterpart to Traction Pro. There are obviously some limitations on the free version, but not like the light versions of Pro DAWs that I'm going to cover next. Go Johnny, start! I got you. Waveform Free includes unlimited tracks, autosave, and plugin sandboxing. The plugin sandboxing is especially awesome. If a plugin crashes, it won't crash Waveform. It only shuts down that plugin instance. You'll also get access to a built-in synth and drum sampler. There aren't many major limitations to this stuff. If you pay for the pro version, you'll get access to more customizable features, quick actions, and plugins, but the free version is already pretty well-rounded. It's really, really good features, and I can't believe that it's free. The only thing that I didn't like about it was probably their UI, the design side of it, but overall, still really good. I've lumped all the pro DAWs together because their free or light versions have some pretty serious limitations. That being said, if you plan on buying them in the future, I highly recommend giving them a go. All right, Johnny, four beats at once. What? I only have two hands. Go. Cubase, Pro Tools, Ableton, and FL Studio are all pro DAWs that are widely used by music producers and engineers. They each have different feature sets and workflows, which is why it's important to try them out before buying to see if they work for you. The limitations on these trials range from not being able to save your projects on FL Studio and a 16 track limit on Ableton and Pro Tools. Cubase LE is only free if you own a piece of hardware that came with it and only sports up to 16 audio tracks and 24 MIDI tracks. Finally, my favorite category, the almost free DAWs. There are two that are touted as free and one that is, in my opinion, the holy grail of free DAWs. All right, Johnny, hit me more with that spicy fire that you use in your taco. Warming up the grill. Clink, 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 clink. You know, like Benihana's. The first almost free DAW is our door. It's a fully functional DAW and it's listed as free on the main website, but it will periodically go silent after 10 minutes of use. Now it's totally worth paying for, especially at this price. It has a monthly subscription model of one, four, 10 or $50 per month or a one-time pay-what-you-can fee with amounts above $45 receiving updates. Ardour's feature set is similar to a pro DAW, unlimited tracks, stock plugins, automation, and mix groups. The next almost free DAW is SoundBridge, which is also fully functional like Ardour. It is free to download, but a pop-up will happen randomly, asking you to donate. If you're fine with the occasional pop-up, then this DAW could work for you. Its notable features are its graphic user interface scaling if you want to make the whole DAW bigger or smaller, and its touchscreen support for tablets. Finally, we have my personal favorite, the holy grail of free DAWs. Reaper. While this DAW is not technically free, its trial length and price are more than enough to earn it a spot on this list. From the time you download it and install it, Reaper gives you a full free three months, 90 days to try it out. After those 90 days are up, you can just continue evaluating it, but I highly recommend paying the measly $60 for this fully functional pro DAW. Honestly, Reaper is hands down the cheapest, most customizable, fully functioning DAW available today. There are no caveats. I highly suggest trying it for 90 days and paying for it afterwards. And no, Reaper did not sponsor this video. Man, you're such a sucker. I hate you. <laughs> See, he did. He did go the Reaper route at the end. Yep, yep. Wow. Oh, and we got tacos. <laughs> Where's my taco? Uh, yeah, on the Benny Honda grill. <laughs> now, nice. I did manage to get all of those into our DAW machine. I will be looking uh, uh, more at them. And interesting approaches to the, the last couple he mentioned, which like he said, they're free with the exception mm -hmm. of like timing out every 10 minutes. That I'm, I'm not sure I appreciate yeah, okay. that, that approach. Um, 
I would rather that one would kill me. Yeah, I, I would rather any other approach than the occasional random <laughs> timing out because you yeah. never know when that would happen. Well, not only that, but my headset cuts out sometimes, <laughs> so I would just assume that my headset's cutting out. So I'd start waggling the wire, and it wouldn't be the headset cutting out; it would be the dog going silent. Like, no. Now there's two different ways it can go silent on me randomly. It's like, don't do that. Well, and, and how <laughs> anything how these. Pr- software programs this the software companies decide to take their approach there you know that's that's something that like they have to decide whether that's conducive to getting a customer or or not and i'm sure if it you know if it is getting them customers and it does work with that approach i'm sure they hear shit (laughs) sometimes for for some of those approaches the 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 yeah. reaper approach to me is the most elegant um granted not everybody will jump on and eventually pay but considering that the price point is so low sixty dollars mm-hmm. is not that much if i was gonna pay for a die i'd have a much easier time going with sixty dollars than five hundred yeah, for sure. And uh, like like Uni was saying, like, you know, just wanting to just sing, right? Like, which which DAW is going to be the most out of your way and just let you get started? Like, you just want to jump in, hit record and go, yeah. you know, like, so that's, you know, if that's your focus, then you, you'd be looking for the workflow that gets you to that point the quickest. And, and, and in that scenario, even that honorable mention of Audacity, you know, it, mm-hmm. Audacity doesn't have anything on the MIDI side, but at the same time, if you're just recording audio... It's a very easy one to dive into, easy to learn. Um, people been using it since the 90s and still are using it to this day. Mm-hmm. Yep. I can't even remember all the DAWs that I've used over the years. It's like I remember Cakewalk from way back when. I remember Traction at one point. I mean, there's there's just so many of them that, you know, it's hard to even remember them all. But if I saw the screens or started looking at them again, it's like, oh, yeah, then this and this and this. And, you know, it starts coming back after yeah. a while if it. And, and, you know, some of this advice is going to be changing this year. Uh, You know, he started with Cakewalk by BandLab recommendation uh, as far as like the best free choice for like the last five years, six years. If you're on Windows has been Cakewalk by BandLab. It is the most powerful and unlimited option. But because they are. They are going back to, you know, uh, a paid product with Sonar. Things are things are going to change and Cakewalk by BandLab won't be an option in the future. But at the same time, they are opening up Cakewalk Next and Sonar. Those will start to become cross-platform. Uh, Next especially is ready to go on Mac or Windows. So... Uh, if that's going to be the case with sonar as well i'm excited to actually see sonar work on in both worlds that's always been a uh, uh it's always been a hindrance to me that like my my go to daw is windows only because i i work mm-hmm. with musicians who also use macs and it'd be nice to be able to have a daw that can play nice in both worlds i want to be able to exchange source projects and if if it can work in both worlds like reaper already does uh that's a big sell for me in the future yeah for sure i do like the uh, i do like cross-platform a lot of it is comes down to testing you know they just they don't have people in house to test both or they don't choose to you know put the effort into you know troubleshooting and testing on well, a lot of times you, they are two separate camps and they don't want to go into the other camp. So like the Mac guys don't (laughs) want to touch windows and the windows guys don't want to touch the Mac better to have an open mind there. Um, You know, if you're getting into production and you are dealing with different people's projects, that's one of the reasons why I need a virtual machine like this. Someone wants to send me a pro tools project. I want to be able to load the source. Mm-hmm. 
What's funny is uh, there was all that kind of siloing with the Mac stuff over the years during doing tech support since the 90s, like we said. And in a lot of the cases, it would be like the marketing department would be all Mac. And they would have you know their own guy who was the Mac guy. And it was like the one guy or two guys that were you know, the Mac guys that would take care of all that. And then you know the rest of the team was you know 10 guys or whatever taking care of all of the you know all the pc users because it was a very small percentage of the environment that would be mac but over the years yes it would be you know it would come to us to do everything now you know and be responsible for the you know the full environment so you had to get yourself used to it so i would have um i still have it somewhere um i have you know like a mac tower around that you know i could just i would be able to boot it up and you know look at some things to see oh they're trying to do this this and this and try to walk myself through what i'm going to go look at over there uh, at least you didn't just at least sure. you didn't piss your money away on a colored iMac <laughs> <laughs> no but matter of fact I actually I have like one of the ones that was all in one like I have one in the other room because like my sister had gotten it at one point because she was a, a school teacher at the time and that's the other place that you see a lot of Macs was in the education so she had that for a long long time and this is like when it was already ancient old whatever and the screen broke on them or whatever she just you know gave it to me to look at and there's, you know, there's an output on the back, so you can just use the video card and go to an actual other screen. It was the screen, the internal screen. It, the it almost it almost so, always was the screen that would crap out. Right. Yeah, so it's like, okay, well, here's, you know, you could use a flat panel and just use it. And they're like, oh, we already got a new one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they, they'd already got a new machine. So, you know, it was just more getting, you know, it was garbage to them, but I could, you know, I could actually, you know, plug a monitor into it and do something on it if I wanted to. So, well. That's the way that's and done. as Uni mentioned, Cakewalk is still free. Uh, I I installed it just before the show tonight on our our DAW machine, so it is still out there. If you, you do a Google search for Cakewalk by BandLab, you'll find the page. The installer is still out there. It's still available. Um, it authenticates to your BandLab account, and from what I'm reading, they don't plan on turning that off like anytime soon and i'm i'm sure they'll give us some warning if 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 they're going to deactivate it that way i i hope i hope they don't um mm -hmm. it, if i can continue to use it with the projects that i have i'm more inclined to actually move to sonar in the future knowing that like this it's being handled properly i don't want to be forced right. to like upgrade my projects mm -hmm. yeah you don't want a gun to your head yeah. sure yeah, that does not make that does not bode well in my software <laughs> uh decisions <laughs> So no. that was at lander music uh great mm -hmm. recommendations there and it's on the free side there are a bunch of new ones that that i had not been familiar with that i've now got in there definitely going to be taking a look at some of those nice and and we have another one this one's kind of a hybrid uh it, mm -hmm. it, it's free and paid options little bit different suggestions it's coming from at neo moon studios another freshie mm -hmm. bst design and development agency oh cool <laughs> well i'd like to get more into uh, uh vst development uh making plugins is actually not that complicated i mean i've i've been a programmer for a long time and mm -hmm. if i can get into vst programming i i think there's still a very good market there oh, absolutely so at neo moon studios we're going to take a look at uh, uh, their recommendations of the eight best DAWs of 2024. And it does say 2024. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Free and paid options. We're going to look at the best free and paid digital audio workstations or DAWs on the market in 2024. This list is in no particular order in terms of preference. We use Ableton at Neo Moon Studios, but we've dabbled with all of the DAWs that you'll find in this list today. At the end of the day, it just really boils down to which DAW has the features and workflows that you're most comfortable with. It can take many months to get comfortable with a DAW, so find one that you like and just try to learn it inside and out. The truth is that most of these DAWs do pretty much the same thing. Also, I should mention that the paid DAWs in this list all have free trials, so you can download them and play with them to see if they do what you want, 
how you want. So let's jump in and look at these DAWs. So first on the list, we have Ardor. Now Ardor is free and open source. It's a DAW that allows users to record, edit, and mix music. And although Ardor comes bundled with less in terms of built-in instruments and plugins, it's easy enough to add instruments and audio effects plugins into it. And that's because Ardor allows you to use both VST2 as well as VST3 plugins within their DAW. VSTs, for those of you who don't know, are virtual studio technology, and they usually come in the form of virtual instruments or effects plugins. For example, you could add a piano, a synth, a drum, or a specific reverb VST to help you bring your music to life. Also, as a side note, if you want to learn how to develop VSTs without having to know how to code, then head over to Neo Moon today and check out our VST development and design courses. In our courses, you'll learn how to develop and design your own virtual instruments and audio effects plugins from scratch without having to know how to code, which you can then sell on the open market. A link to our courses can be found below. So next up, we have LMMS. This is another free and open source DAW, which arguably doesn't have the most beautiful UI, but it's very powerful. And you can do most with LLMS what you can do with the other DAWs on this list. Again, out of the box, it doesn't have an impressive audio and effects library, but again, it's something that you can add to over time. The main limitation that I see with LMMS is that they don't natively support VST3 plugins, and this is the direction the industry is heading. That said, they do support VST2 plugins, and I've published a workaround to the VST3 issue over on our YouTube channel. In fact, I've published a complete beginner's tutorial on how to use LMMS over on our channel. So if you're looking for a free DAW, this is going to be one of your best bets. So download it and then check out our getting started tutorial to see if this DAW suits your needs. Okay, so now we're going to get out of the free category and into the paid category. Now I've included Reaper early on because it's more affordable than the other paid options in this list. In fact, you can get a discounted commercial license to use this DAW for only $60 as long as your company isn't making over $20,000 in revenue per year. Now, for most people just getting started in music, this discounted license will be more than sufficient. It's also a very good DAW if you're looking for something lightweight. It's much less bloated compared to the other paid DAWs on this list. That said, it doesn't come out of the box with that much, but you can easily extend the functionality of Reaper through a suite of free JS plugins that you can install immediately after you install Reaper. Also, you might not find Reaper very beautiful out of the box, but its look is totally customizable. The community is huge and there are countless skins and themes that you can install to make your installation of Reaper look beautiful. You can get started with Reaper today with a 60 day free trial. Next on the list, we have Cubase. Now, a lot of producers find Cubase a very intuitive and beautiful DAW, and it looks and works great out of the box. And it tends to prioritize space within the UI in a way that makes toggling between different jobs a breeze. For example, adding different types of instruments or toggling between mixing and editing a sample can all be done with the click of a button. You can perform most of what you need to perform from this main interface. And while it is more expensive than Reaper, for example, it also comes with much more out of the box. Even their cheapest plan comes with over 20 gigabytes of sounds and loops. So it's very easy to jump in and just start working with Cubase from day one without having to worry about extending it in any way. Cubase is also available for free to try for 60 days. Next up, we have Logic Pro, which is exclusively available on Mac OS. Again, it's a beautiful DAW out of the box and many producers use it because it doesn't use tiered pricing. You get everything they have to offer at one price. With many of the other paid DAWs in this list, their introductory tier strips back a lot of the paid features, but Logic doesn't take this approach. It comes with a huge number of stock instruments and plugins, which will allow you to get started from day one. Next up, we have Ableton. Now, Ableton is the primary DAW that we use at Neo Moon, and that's because we actually have a VST development agency, which I'll link to below, where we develop audio plugins for individuals or businesses who want to create, brand, or sell their own virtual instruments or audio plugins. So whenever we're creating an instrument, we often use Ableton to help support us through this process. Now it's considered by many to be one of the best DAWs on the market today, but again, it just really boils down to what you're comfortable with and what you're used to. So for example, we recently produced two different tracks and we produced one in Ableton and the other in a free DAW mentioned earlier called LMMS. And honestly, I like the song from the free DAW much more. It just goes to show that your DAW won't make or break your music. What's going to make a great track will be you, not your DAW. But one of the things I love about Ableton is its default session view where tracks are aligned vertically. 
It's a creative approach to music making where you can audition sounds quickly before you add them into the more traditional arrangement view. It's something that I use all the time in Ableton. Again, you can download a 30 day free trial of Ableton to see if it suits your needs. Next up, we have FL Studio. Now it's one of the more popular DAWs on this list and it's especially popular for some reason amongst hip hop producers. I think that's because of their drum sequencing tools, which are just so easy and intuitive to learn how to use. There's also a huge community and countless tutorials online. So the learning curve with FL Studio can be a little less steep than learning some of the other DAWs on this list. Now with FL Studio, you can record music directly into their DAW, you can use third-party VST plugins and use their huge library of built-in samples and loops to get up and running right away. FL Studio uses a tiered pricing structure, but their introductory DAW is more than enough to get most producers started. They also offer a free time unlimited trial, but there are some restrictions there, especially around saving and reopening files. And lastly, let's talk about Pro Tools. Now, some of my favorite producers use Pro Tools. I really like this big workspace browser, and to me, it just feels really open, beautiful, and spacious. Each row within Pro Tools is its own audio track. Now, what I like about this design is that over to the left side of each track, you can manage the content of that track directly in the workspace browser. You don't have to toggle to a property panel to do some of the things that you find yourself doing time and time again. For example, doing things like automation. You can even hand draw automation directly on the track or add and view multiple automation lanes all in one track. You don't have to toggle between different automations or manually change a setting to view multiple automation lanes. You can see all of them stacked up on top of one another by default. So there's just lots that you can do while being able to keep your main workspace browser open. So those are some of the best DAWs of 2024. I hope that you found this tutorial helpful and I hope that I've been able to help you select a DAW for your specific use case and budget. Again, before signing off, I just want to remind you that if you have a VST idea that you're trying to bring to life and you'd like to outsource the design or development of your VST idea, head over to Neo Moon today to see how we might be able to help with your build. I'll provide a link to our VST development agency below. Or like I mentioned before, if you want to do it yourself, we offer comprehensive courses on both no code VST development as well as VST UI design. Links to everything can be found in the description below. Thanks for stopping by today, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Oh, I will be checking out those VST courses. Oh, absolutely. I am That's interested. Very cool VST design. Oh, and he's competing with you <laughs> on the low voice. Another one with the Glenn voice. <laughs> uh, there's so many of us out there now. Well, and he had the same. Okay. He had the same thoughts on Reaper. You know, Reaper is definitely uh, uh, one that you don't see a lot of disagreement on as far as its offerings. Some audio engineers may not use it because they have their preferred DAWs, but they can argue like its functionality. It's out of the box, very optimized, and the price is unparalleled. Yeah for what you get for sure. And again, the fact that they give it to you for free to start to say, Hey, try it, use it, see what you think. And if you like it, buy it. Yeah. And, and as he was showing the different paid ones, you know, he saved the most expensive for last <laughs> with pro tools. Uh, it's not the cheapest. Yep, yep. Um, it is super functional. And in the case of pro tools, if you're like serious about say becoming a mixing engineer an audio engineer, you want to go work at a studio, that's probably the DAW that they're they're going to want you to know. It, mm -hmm. it, it's sure. the one that the the pros out there, the pro studios, are almost exclusively working on. Right. Although, and there's a reason <laughs> that that Cubase uh, uh, trial. I'm going to be getting that in there because I used to be a big Cubase, Cubase guy for a good six, seven years. Um, I went from Cakewalk in like 2001 when it was just becoming Sonar and I shifted to Cubase for almost like a decade and was really happy with it. Um, the only reason why I came back to Cakewalk is after taking a break and 2017 18 ish 
came back mm-hmm. and saw the $500 price tag on Cubase and saw that sonar was now free. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we'll, we'll give this sonar a shot. <laughs> Yeah, let's see about this newfangled thing. <laughs> and 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 I've been happy. I've been happy with Cakewalk by Band Lab for that time. But you know, given the current scenario, uh, I, I'm definitely going to be reevaluating Cubase. Steinberg has always been great at audio development. They make great software. They, as he mentioned, they give you like everything plus the kitchen sink when you do buy buy it and. Um, there's a lot of value in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Very cool. Now, I think we got a couple more that we're going to get to tonight. We're actually running a little bit later than usual, but I think that'll yeah, be fine. We got two more. Um, this one comes from Joshua, uh, Joshua Butler over on YouTube. And mm-hmm. it's just a, a different perspective. Um, you're going to see a few new ones mentioned here uh that i was surprised i didn't see mentioned in the other ones um that's why i wanted to include it and uh at joshua butler music over on youtube and uh, Mm -hmm. again kinds of videos i like to see in studio one one of them i'm going to be looking at (laughs) i will be coming back to visit joshua and some of these and there's cubase pro 13 definitely interested to see what he, what he says there mm-hmm. but what he's going to do here he's going to give his impression of the top 10 DAWs of 2024 and um in comparison to what we've seen uh some of these uh, uh are worthy of mention some of mm-hmm. them have yep. already been mentioned but there's a few in here that should have been mentioned right well, let's see his opinion. We're on YouTube, Josh here with The Creative Weight, and today is going to be a little bit different. I saw a list and I had to comment on it from the fine folks over at Gearspace. It's actually called Gear Sluts. The fine folks at Gearspace made a list of the top 10 DAWs of 2023, and this carries over into 2024 because they haven't released the new one yet. So I just figured I'll go ahead and make a video about it because I more or less did agree with pretty much everything they were saying in the list. I'd say like 90% of it I agreed with. So without further delay, let's hop into what they say. One of the top best DAWs of 2023 was and probably still is going into 24. It should be no surprise to anybody. It is Avid Pro Tools Studio, wildly recognized as one of the best DAWs when it comes to recording, editing, and mixing. Still for the most part, the industry standard, which facilitates easy session exchange between studios and professionals. Pro Tools cons, a bit slow to include new features and not the flashiest doll in terms of innovation. That is the understatement of the century. Pro Tools is easily a decade behind any other doll right now. Uh, But I will say this, I will end Pro Tools, I will end with Pro Tools on a good note. I really like where Avid is going and I did make a video about that. And I really am looking forward to seeing what the new company who just purchased Avid is going to do with it and the direction that they're going to push Pro Tools. So I am still hopeful for Pro Tools. I would like to see it kind of catch up with the rest of the class. Number two on the list, Apple Logic Pro. I can I can agree with that also. I've, I've done a lot of session work in, in Logic Pro and it's, it's an amazing DAW. Pro is the best DAW when it comes to bundled content. Absolutely can agree with that. With an ever-growing array of excellent plugins, samples, and virtual instruments that will likely be more than enough for casual users. Cons. Audio Audio editing is still not as flexible as others Mac only. Yep, that's kind of a big con and that is actually why I kind of got away from Logic Pro because a lot of my friends do use PC. Believe it or not, people still use PCs to make music. I was one of them for a little while. I went back and forth from Mac to PC. But I would say Logic, yeah, I agree with that. Number two is pretty cool. Number three is going to be Steinberg's Cubase Pro 13. Okay, let's read what they have to say about it. Pros, arguably, absolutely the most well-rounded DAW out there in terms of content and features. It might be a notch below Apple's flagship Logic Pro in terms of content, but it has the benefit of working on both Mac and Windows 
system. Cons, relatively expensive. Okay, I can agree with that. I, actually, I can agree with all that. I really think Cubase Pro uh, 13 especially is doing a really good job, and I really do think it's one of the top DAWs. In my personal opinion, I think Logic Pro and Cubase are kind of the best dolls if you want to just get into music production right out of the gate. Now, you have to get Cubase Pro because I've not really had any experience with any of the lower tiers. I know Cubase Pro 12 and 13, 12 had a lot of stuff, and 13 come with even more stuff. So, so I can agree with this list. Number four, okay, they're definitely not putting them in any particular order because they say Reaper is number four. And all you Reaper fans are going, but it is number four, it's number one. Eh, it's, it's not bad, I have used it. I have used it, but not to really the fullest extent, so I can honestly say I'm not a professional. Let's see what they say about it. A highly capable and immensely flexible doll with deep customization. It definitely has customization. Reaper is your best pick if you want total control. It's also extremely affordable and basically a no-brainer for the cost savvy studio. Cons, the deep tweakability might be a bit too nerdy for some and that there's a good chance of getting lost amongst all the settings and options. I agree with everybody when they say it's it's very light, it's only it's under 100 megabytes for the download, you can buy it for 60 bucks. It's totally capable of doing whatever you probably need it to do, but I'm not that nerdy, as they said in little quotes. So I just, there was a lot of stuff that I had to change. It took me a solid two hours to get it to where I liked it. And then after I realized I could just go into Studio One and it's set up the way I want it, I just went ahead and went back to Studio One and I've not even produced a song in Reaper. But I'll give it kudos. It is a great DAW. I know a lot of people who use it and they swear by it. So let's go on to the next DAW. Ableton Live 12, sweet. Of course, they're not gonna list the entry level ones. Pros, streamlined for composition and live performance like no other DAW, agreed. Live heralded a new era for electronic, what, uh, whatever that word means. For music production, it can be even more uh, effective when used with special live friendly controllers which are optimized for the software's array of performance features. Cons, a very idiocentric piece of software whose unique work workflow may or may not appeal to some, and those hardware controllers feel somewhat necessary to get the best out of it. Um, I have the Novation Launchpad X, and I have, I don't really feel like I need that controller to make music. Granted, I really like having it when I'm using Ableton Live, but I don't, I don't agree with that little last section. I don't think you need hardware. The only thing that stopped me from really going to Ableton Live more full-time was the lack of ARA integration. It doesn't have ARA still, even with 12. That's why I'm not upgrading to 12, I'm still on 11. And no, you don't just use ARA for Melodyne vocal pitch correction. I use Melodyne all the time for instrument pitch manipulation. So I like to change instruments around and stuff. And it's both, both monophonic and polyphonic. So I can edit acoustic guitars or just basic bass lines. I really wish Ableton would bring us ARA because that would put me in Ableton a lot more. So on to the next one. And I'll put the number, I think we're on number five. Yay, PreSonus Studio One 6.5. This is my, my daily driver right here. This is my main DAW. Pros, another solid contender that has been climbing the ranks over the past few years. Studio One is now almost 10 years old and has improved greatly on all areas since its introduction. Cons, hardly any. Although it might not match the level of included content that Cubase and Logic Pro give you for the cost of admission. And they are absolutely correct on that. My biggest complaint with Studio One, and I've made videos about this, the plugins are outdated, the stock sounds are trash. Cubase destroys Studio One for stock plugins and stock sounds and virtual instruments. Again, I it's my DAW. I use it. I'm not going anywhere. I really wish they'd bring us some, you know, modern amenities. That'd be great, guys. Come on, pre us, please. So the next one on the list, Bitwig Studio 5. Now, I have to be honest with you guys and say this is the one on the list that I have very little experience with. Let's see what they have to say about it. Pros, Bitwig has all the features of a complete DAW and also uh, great solutions for live performing. Currently it's on 4.4. It I don't think it's on 4.4 right now because they have 5 up there. I think it's on like 5.2 or something like that at the time of recording this. Uh, the software has made huge improvements by adding new features and enhanced uh, enhancing its workflow. I have very little experience with this. I did use it for about a day or two and I, I made a couple of beats in it. And it was, it was good, I just don't know enough about it to really comment on it, but it seemed like a very capable doll from the, the limited experience that I had. Let's see what the next one is. ImageLine, FL Studio 
all plugins edition. Now they have to specifically say that because if you get the $100 version of FL Studio, it's not a DAW. And for those of you thinking, yeah, it is, it's a real DAW. You can't record audio in the basic version and you can't edit audio in the basic version. Digital audio workstation. So it's just a digital workstation. If you get FL, you're probably gonna not just buy the $100 version anyway, so that doesn't really matter. Let's see what the fine folks at Gearspace have to say about it. Pros, a favorite amongst electronic musicians, producers, and beat makers, FL Studio has added many features and improvements over the years, and it's now a very complete package. I'd agree with all that, actually. Cons, not the most well-rounded for working with genres other than electronic music. Yep, there's their understatement of the year. Um, FL Studio, I think, is great. And like I said, unless you get the $100 version, in which case it's not a real doll. On to the next one, Reason Studios... Reason 12, did I read that right? Reason Studios, Reason 12. Okay, I don't know anything about this one, just to let you guys know. Pros, after being merged with its sister audio capturing doll, Record, a few years ago, Reason is now a fully fledged doll that can tackle anything from comp uh, composition to recording and mixing, which looks a lot like a fun with its SSL-esque mixer. Cons, basically none since VST support was implemented on a recent version. Man, I haven't used Reason since it was just Reason Rack and Pro Tools 7.3, I think it was. And that looks very similar to how it used to look back in the day. I know that's Ableton in the background, but this rack section right here looks very similar to how it looked over a decade ago when I used Pro Tools. Eh, again, I don't know enough about it. A lot's changed, I'm sure, and I just, I don't know enough about it. Feel free to comment down below if you use Reason. I've heard great things about it, but I'm very uneducated when it comes to that. So on to the last one on the list, Mode 2 Digital Performer 11. When I said I was uneducated on the last one, I am very uneducated on this one. I don't know anything about Digital Performer. Uh, pros, DP is a solid all-round doll, more packed with features than ever before in its ninth iteration, but it has been especially widely praised over the years for its efficient on scoring and MIDI work in general. A favorite of film composers indeed. Okay, I thought Hans Zimmer used Cubase, but what do I know? Cons, none. Now. No, oh, none now that it also supports Windows. It didn't support Windows. It was only available on Mac before, huh? And well, hey, there you go. If you didn't know that, I didn't know that either. We just both learned something. Feel free to comment down below. I don't know anything about Digital Performer. I've heard great things about it, but I don't know anything about DP. So that's the list according to the fine folks over at Gears Gearspace. What do you guys think? Let's start a conversation down below. What do you think of this list? And again, this is a 2023 list. My number one DAW is Studio One, and I just sat here and I talked trash about it because no DAW is perfect. Uh, what do you guys think of this list? Feel free to leave a comment down below. Let's start a conversation, and I will see you guys in the next video. Remember, it's called Music Theory, not Music Fact. Have a good one. Oh, I like his little catchphrase there at the end. Music theory, not music fact. <laughs> and that's right, Uni. Motu, Mark of the Unicorn. We got yes, Uni you got your own. And and that digital performer, um, I would have been much more, because it's been around like Cakewalk. It, Mark of the mm -hmm. Unicorn goes back to their early days of MIDI for me. Like I've had their interfaces, but digital performer being Mac only, um, is why I went with Cakewalk in the early days. It was the only Windows uh, uh, sequencer I could find. And when I first started going to the mountain that I was telling you about, that festival uh, for music, they were using Mac up there, and it was always the Motus that you know that they were you know they had an aggregate device with the Motus and this and that, and so all of that was how I kind of started with all of that. <laughs> you know, well, and, and they do they do make they made awesome MIDI interfaces. I haven't had one of theirs for a while now but um they used to be like the midi interface go-to mm -hmm. yep and they were doing you know at that point they were just trying to you know, get full recordings of uh probably um 16 or i don't know if it was 16 or 24 at that point tracks that they were trying to record simultaneously into the mac and you know getting the whole thing going on a stage that's kind of out in the middle of a field so it's kind of you know trying to get it all uh, coordinated at that point, but it, it's come a long way over the years for sure. Well, now that now that it supports Windows, I will be giving it a, a second look. And yeah, sure. As, as for the other choices, 
that were there. Um, Studio One, surprised mm-hmm. that that took three different recommendation videos for somebody to mention Studio One. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has become a, a contender. It's in my short list of like, mm-hmm. this is a DAW. I got to... I got to get on to my machine. I want one of their their MIDI surfaces to complement it and mm-hmm. and see how Personas integrates, you know, the hardware with the DAW. That that's yep. a compelling reason to use a certain DAW. If if that DAW works nice with your hardware, better than the other ones, that is a good reason to use that DAW. I've been using Cakewalk because it recognizes my instruments on on my Roland Phantom. The right. only other the only other DAW that can recognize my keyboard out of the box is Cubase. So like those two with the gear I have, great choices. Any other gear, I'm going to have to figure out how to map my instrument sets into that DAW. Mhm. Exactly. Same with these uh, MIDI control surfaces these days. I was playing with Mavi's um, uh, setup over the weekend last weekend. We were we were trying to get his. He, he's got uh, I think it's a M Audio or he, he's got one of those like MIDI controller keyboards with mm-hmm. knobs that can be mapped. Sure. And we looked into you know configuring Cakewalk in in that case so that you know you turn this knob and you adjust this in the DAW, Mm -hmm. the easier that gets. And with your hardware, these are the kinds of features that I want to see. And that's why with some of them, they have just a a MIDI learn function where you hit the button, you know, MIDI learn, and then you wiggle the whatever knob or button or thing on the MIDI controller that you want to use. And it goes, oh, that one. Now, what do you want that to do? And basically you're able to map you know, without having to know, oh, that's, you know, C16 or button, you know, D42, or whatever, like, you know, whatever, without having to know what button it is, you just tell it MIDI learn, and then you you move the thing that you want it to be, and they say, okay, that, <laughs> let's make yeah. that do the thing. Yeah, and that's what we were looking at, was, mm-hmm. like, using the learn function to mm-hmm. train, you know, the different knobs. Not yeah. as not as easy or elegant as I would have liked it to be. It was, um, there's different standards for automation control and, and for surfaces. So you got to kind of get familiar with the protocols before you can get the hardware to to talk to the DAW. But in the case of Studio One, like it is, the DAW is designed with the surface controllers that they sell in mind. So mm-hmm. You you load that DAW and those surfaces are ready to go. No programming yeah. needed. Exactly, and that's where again the um, you know, we use the um, the Studio Live boards, whether it's the twenty four or the thirty two, and just having it mapped directly into Studio One or into Capture is what we usually use if we're just trying to capture out of the board. But it it is very convenient. You bring up a project, it'll snap all the faders on the board. You know, you can it'll ask, do you want to snap all the faders? And you tell it yes. All the faders, whatever they're set in the software. The hardware surface, you know, immediately snaps all the faders to those positions for you, and everything's already there. And again, the thing for me is just being able to go to each of the tracks and be like, okay, that's a bass track, and immediately by loading it as a bass track, it knows exactly how to EQ it. It knows how to you know, put a compressor on it. It gives you a good starting point of what a bass track should be, you know, in the whole channel strip. So it's a really good starting point. Yeah, yeah, I want that gear. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably keep the video one day when I'm over at the uh, over at his studio, and you know we'll, we'll go over some of that. Like you know, look at some of the screens or whatever, shoot a little video of whatever of us using yeah. the hard. Yeah. Show off that gear. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, the the other surprise uh, of all those um, was Propeller Head's reason. Yeah, reason that, I forgot one, about that one too. Same here. Like I used to use it like a, a lot back in the early mid two thousands, and. Um, at that time, you know, it was like they called it Reason Rack, and it it was uh, ahead of its time then for like loading in multiple VSTs and, and instruments and um, wiring them. You know, the rewire approach, which at the right. time was I love was that. Big, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a big standard, and it it made it, like every DAW was integrating rewire it into mm-hmm. their their configuration because it was so popular and 
it kind of fell off the map. <laughs> like when I was watching this, I was like, whoa, uh, I, I got to include this one because he, he mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been a while since I thought about that. And actually, as you mentioned it, like in the mid two thousands, I, I wasn't even really, I wouldn't even really considered myself a musician much at that point yet. Cause I had the, the piano lessons as a kid, you know, trumpet for a year and then the, a little bit of guitar throughout the years, but only a couple songs and no real technique or lessons or any of that kind of stuff. I didn't really start getting into that again until 2008, nine, because I think my base I bought, uh, it's a 2009 model, and that was the first base I ever bought. And then I got my, my guitar, the SG, the year after. So those are 2009, 2010. And that's when I really started, you know, getting into music seriously again more recently. So that's, you know, 14 years at this point. So some of it, some of it got in there. Some of it sunk in. So that's good. Well, and, and hey, it, that was a good time to get back into music. Uh, VST3 mm -hmm. support started kicking in. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of these DAWs we're seeing started getting developed mm -hmm. around that time. Uh, digital music was going through a, 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 a second phase of evolution. Like the the first phase we dealt with like going from analog to digital um the DAWs sucked crashed all the time vsts like you kept your fingers crossed if you were loading <laughs> vst1 or vst2 that that your computer was going to play nice with it and by 2010 everything started to settle in the mm -hmm. the plugins you see now like the tape warmers and the ability to sound analog in the digital world mm -hmm. has finally hit its stride yep and 2010 was when i decided i had i had bought the bass and i bought the guitar and i never had any time to play with my toys because i was too busy going back and forth working in new york city <laughs> so like i was constantly commuting and doing tech support in new york city so at that point i actually took uh, about a year and a half off and basically focused on bass and you know a little bit of guitar and music theory and just trying to do as much you know get as much in as i could every day and you know for a year and a half i really kind of focused on that and then i just kept doing it while you know getting back to work after that did more tech support went to the new york city as well as other places you know doing um, corporate tech support again and then uh, you know went back to you know music part-time but it's, it's always been there but it's just more um more in the foreground over the last 10 15 years at this point yeah, yeah, yeah. At this point, when I asked myself, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? <laughs> Music was the number one answer. Yeah, and it's a good answer. And it's a good time for it. Again, like you're saying, I mean, seeing where everything was in it and the fact that we had exposure to a lot of the stuff in its infancy, you know, when the stuff was coming up and now it's had all these years to mature and progress to where they are today, where there's so many different options that are free and reasonable and everything else that uh, you know you'll find something that works for your workflow or you'll find some reason why each of the like you find some certain project where you know this you know where reaper would be the best or a different project fl studio would be the best or a different well, project and, and, and that's be. just it that's part of the reason why i'm re-evaluating you know these daws because it's true if you're a beat maker fruity loops you're gonna love like out the box ready to go at, for beat makers and you know if if you're recording say a band and you, you've got a good interface to like get them all in on separate tracks uh pro tools or studio one uh cubase cakewalk all of those are good considerations over there if I, uh, I'd be still looking at reason too. If I, if I really want to play with like the, the different synthesizers available. Yeah. And again, that was fun for the rewire, just, you know, flipping around the rack and like, Oh, wire this to this and this to that. You really can see how it all comes together in the hardware aspect. They're trying to bridge that gap between, you know, to keep the familiarity of the people who would work with the hardware and understood all of how all that was trying to move to the software side. It made it much more natural. For them. And and that was part of its like benefit and disadvantage, mm -hmm. because f for those who were used to like wiring up and patch baying synthesizers and things like that, mm -hmm. Reason was they felt right at home. Exactly. For those who were new to it, and you know that that like screen shock when you bring up the program and you see all these knobs and dials and it's like what do they do what do they do um mm -hmm. we're we're not all inclined to just go try every knob <laughs> right well it's like if you were, were to walk into a commercial airliner cockpit 
and just so many buttons and knobs and everything else. Like, how the hell do you know that one and that one and that one? You know, it's like you, you realize it's, you know, it's about focusing on panels and breaking things down into, you know, this section and that section. Oh, there's the avionics. There's this like, you know, each area has its own thing. And then each of their their sub things in there that you look at. So it's a matter of breaking down the whole field. But everything you need to be able to get to should all be reasonably close and easy to access. That's the main thing. And, and, and I would say if, if you're evaluating a DAW, um, mm -hmm. like I, I like to bring them up, kind of look at the interface, feel mm -hmm. my way around. I, I'm That's the approach I tend to take with software yep. and see what things are doing. But if you're really serious about trying out that DAW, hit up YouTube, yeah. look for some tutorials and give that DAW a chance. Don't just try to make it work all, all on your own and decide like, oh, screw this DAW because I, I couldn't figure out how to get my audio into track one. Mm -hmm. Give it a chance. Look at some tutorials. There's great ones out there nowadays mm -hmm. and um, at least warm up to it before you decide like it's a piece of crap. Well, like, for example, Creative Sauce's videos. I mean, he had so many good ones for how do you do things in Cakewalk, for example. So find for whichever DAW you want to look at, find, you know, find the Creative Sauce for that one. <laughs> you know, find the yeah. video that, that resonates with you for how do you get in there? How do you, you know, get started on a project? How do you access some of these features? You know, somebody to get you off the ground on a video like that. And when I do go to Studio One to play with it, he's going to be my go-to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. At, le at least one of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. And we got time and Joshua here, I will be going back to you because I see Studio One there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we'll Joshua, Joshua Butler Music. Uh, I, I like his opinions. He's straightforward. Uh, and I thought it was Gear Sluts, too. <laughs> <laughs> sure seems like Gear, it, right? Gear Space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That works. <laughs> so now we're going to look at a unique DAW um, that didn't get mentioned here, but uh, this one's making a lot of noise over on YouTube. A lot of, lot of people have been playing with this one, and I've been hearing rave reviews of how good it really is at separating instruments and almost bringing back stems from where stems did not exist. Yeah. And that should make things a whole lot easier for, you know, cleaning up recordings again, taking things like a live recording and being able to try to separate things out. Um, I'd be interested to see how well you could separate out things like crowd noise and things like that. If those are you know part of what's going on, we'd have to see about that. Interesting. Have stuff. a good night. Have a good night. Uni. It's great to see you. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. Like always. Running a little bit late, so it's past your bedtime. So <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be past mine soon. <laughs> so we'll jump into this one. This is uh home studio simplified. Yep, this is at home studio simplified. Uh, uh dream, create, and achieve. Uh again, a channel with you know, uh mixing a song in cakewalk by band lab. So, mm -hmm. like there's a whole bunch of uh of videos just on that. Mm-hmm. Ultimate Cakewalk tutorial course. I can't believe I haven't been here before. <laughs> well, you were spoiled. You had you had Mike taking care of things, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I figured it out early. <laughs> but th this DAW is definitely one that um, I'm going to be playing with because I have tons of situations where I get thrown tracks where things aren't broken up. Uh, people are making beats over on band lab. They throw me a, a track that's got drums, that's got instruments and they can't separate them because the looper over on band lab doesn't do it. And, mm -hmm. um, this is something that's useful in multiple ways. Yeah. One place that I can see it being useful also is in that same studio that we use out in Pennsylvania. Sometimes we don't have everybody fully isolated. We're just doing a jam in the room. And it's not that we're having, you know, uh, just one recording in the middle of the room. We might still be recording individual tracks, but you'll hear bleed over. So like if I'm recording somebody playing congas while I'm playing bass and somebody else is playing guitar and somebody else is playing keys, all that stuff is coming through the speakers in the room and it's all getting into that conga mic. So we're hearing it in there. But if you were able to use something like this to really clean that up and just say, okay, this is now just the congas, we can erase the rest of the stuff because we already have those individually, you know, stemmed already. 
so we can then clean up essentially that track so that it's no longer dependent on the others. And, and that's the other thing I would be testing it out on is if it helps to clean up that situation, that's mm -hmm. a much easier approach than that go in and try to gate and noise reduce or any modern trick you might do for that situation if this can do it and do it easier and faster it's a better choice yeah and what a lot of times we'll do is you know anything that we're doing as a first recording like that like the first time through we're just getting structure we're getting timing we're getting you know parts figured out and then we're going to come back around and we're not going to use any of those parts anyway we're going to each redo all of those parts but when we have them do the, the conga part for example we'll just have them put on headphones and only you know kill the room sound and have it just record you know as if he's in a booth by himself. So we will go back and, you know, do those right at the end anyway, but it would be easier if like he had a particularly good run, for example, and wanted to use what we had there, but there was too much going on in the room or somebody who talked or somebody, you know, a door slammed somewhere or whatever, like all that kind of stuff. If that could be isolated out, that would be. You know, and, and, and a lot of that's easy to isolate um, with, yeah. with these newer isolating approaches. I mean, this one is utilizing AI, AI to, mm -hmm you know, help it to start to find those weird sounds that don't belong and put them in their own space. Exactly. And I love where that's going, that AI is pushing in that direction. Yeah, yeah. This is the part of AI that doesn't scare me. <laughs> yep. So this is RipX, right? Yep. RipX is the DAW. Mm -hmm. Let's check it out. For the channel, I'm Robert McClellan, and today we're taking a look at the RipX Doll Pro. If you've been wanting to hone your music production skills and are ready for a more sophisticated tool, the RipX Doll might just be the tool that you're looking for. Let's explore some of the features and functionalities that make this program stand out. Hold on, before we embark on this journey, make sure that you're subscribed to this channel and that you have that notification bell activated. Now, let's get down to business. The RipX Doll Pro is making waves in the music production scene and has been finding its way into the hands of beginners and pros alike. It's well known for its advanced audio manipulation capabilities, so let's dissect the core features that set this particular program apart. Firstly, let's talk about the interface. RipX Doll Pro boasts a sleek design tailored for efficiency, and there are a lot of customization options as well, ensuring that your workspace aligns seamlessly with your workflow. Secondarily, let's check out the advanced editing tools. Now, this is where the magic happens. RipX Doll Pro offers an array of advanced features from nuanced time stretching to precise pitch correction. Now, if you seek precision and control over your audio, then this is definitely the program for that. Everything from transposing, pitch shifting, and even an intuitive drop-in feature that allows you to seamlessly insert loops or other sampled material that will automatically adjust for time to ensure that mashups or remixes are done seamlessly. Now, perhaps one of the most useful features of this program is its ability to help you break down any song into separate audio files and solo specific instruments. Then you can take that a step further and utilize the built-in chord chart to follow along. A harder passage, like say a guitar solo for instance, can be slowed down if need be until you can nail that solo, making this an awesome learning tool for either learning complete songs or specific areas of a song that maybe have eluded you. Now, another awesome feature of the RipX Doll Pro is that it boasts some incredible audio repair tools, allowing you to take audio that may otherwise be considered useless and actually salvage it for usability. If you're experiencing writer's block or maybe you're just not sure where to start out with a song, maybe you need some inspiration. You can click on the brain icon, which will allow you to use AI algorithms to take that thought that you have on paper and turn it into an idea in no time. If you're needing inspiration, you can simply type into the browser what your current mood is, and it will spit out something to you that is, in my opinion, very usable. Another cool feature is that with the RipX note manipulation technology, you can take a guitar, for instance, and lay down some simple bass line with the program, and then go back and change that into a bass, a kick, or any of the other awesome sounds that are built in within this DAW. Now, let's weigh the pros and cons for a more balanced assessment of this program. For the pros, because we like good news first, the intuitive interface actually helps to lend itself towards efficiency. It has robust editing tools for precision and handles precision very well. It has a diverse array of virtual instruments and plugins, and I think it has a little bit of something for everybody. For the beginner, it can definitely be a great learning tool for you to learn a song that maybe you haven't been able to nail just yet. For those who are intermediate, you can take audio manipulation to the next level. And for advanced users, take that pre-existing audio that you've already mixed out 
and be able to fix some areas of that that you couldn't do with your pre-existing DAW. Okay, now for the bad news. The cons are it has a steep learning curve for intermediate users even, and it's very resource intensive on certain systems, especially older systems I don't think would be able to handle this workload. But to be honest, I think that's about all I can think of right now as far as cons are concerned. All that said, I know that there are a wide variety of individuals within my audience that use a wide variety of different programs. So my question is, have you used the RipX doll and what are your thoughts? Leave those in the comment section down below. I'd love to hear from you on that. My main hang up is the learning curve that's associated with it. And while there might be a steep learning curve, I believe also that the wealth of features and capabilities make it a worthwhile endeavor to learn. It just takes a little bit of time to navigate around. Now that wraps up our brief overview of the RipX Doll Pro. If you found this review helpful, give it a thumbs up and remember that we can dream alone, we can even create alone. But together, we can achieve so much more. Holy crap, did I see that right? He built that just from a prompt, got the individual mm -hmm. pieces that it put together. Dude, I am basically he started with the prompt and then I think he added all those other parts by himself, like added the the drums, the bass, the the drums, the bass, the guitar. Well, I liked it to the idea. I, I liked the, the intro. The I liked yeah, the, when he did the prompt and the intro that came in, just that it it did mm -hmm. exactly what he asked, and it came in with just that yeah. snare. And if he built all of that just based off of that little bit of AI feedback, that is awesome. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think that was awesome because it, it reminded me of the song starter that was in the band lab thing, you know, being able to just jump in and have a nugget of something to start with, you know, it's a progression, it's a little hook, it's whatever, it's gives you a nugget of something to start and build. Yeah, on but this is, and to make this is even cooler progression. because you can be specific about what you're looking for. The song starter was kind of like a roll the dice here. Let's try these chords here, try these chords, but this is right kind of bridging that like prompt approach with, with right. I like that it, and if it does provide like if i was going to use something like ai to build parts i want those parts mm -hmm. in the format that i ask for them so don't give me strings as audio give me strings as midi <laughs> i want to be able to change the patch um give me this as audio you know there are certain things that would be cool uh, across the board this is an interesting daw it is going on our machine
Oh yeah. And just from that, just from that prompt, like you mentioned, I mean, you could just for starters, just any any style of music. You could just, you know, prompt it and say, you know, give me something in a metal style, give me something in other style. Like, you know, you tell it the instrumentation you want, you tell it the style you want, and just have it give you, you know, just spit out chunks of whatever, and then you can start building on any of those as a song nugget starting point. If yeah. it's if it starts an idea, then it's a useful thing. Absolutely. I mean, that stuff happens all the time where like a lot of times we'll be sitting around in rehearsal and, you know, somebody was tuning their instrument or whatever, and they just do a little riff or a little run and somebody will be like, oh, what was that? And they're just like, oh, that was just, you know, whatever in B flat. And it's like, oh, hang on. And, you know, it turns into a whole thing because it triggered something in the other person. Then it becomes a, a feedback back and forth. And all of a sudden there's a groove going and, you know, everybody jumps in and now you got a song going. Somebody starts writing words and boom, it just happens. Yeah, that, that's how a jam <laughs> begins. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the fun ones, for sure. Sorry we ran a little late tonight, guys, but we did get we managed to get a lot in and go over a lot of material. And we're gonna revisit that uh, that virtual machine again because that is a lot of DAWs that we got packed on there already. Oh, and oh yes, this machine will be coming back because it's now our guinea pig. Mm -hmm, exactly. And and I I, I am so curious to see like Windows 10, Windows 11. Like after I get done mm -hmm. with this Windows 10 and I get all those DAWs set up. What I'm going to do mm -hmm. is I'm going to clone that machine and call it Windows mm -hmm. 11. And then I'm going to upgrade the Windows 11 so I don't have to reset up the DAWs. Like, why yep. why reinvent that wheel? And and yep. I will be able to see it in both environments. And, and you'll find out how much it likes to be upgraded from 10 to 11 versus I'll clean uh, all of 11. That, <laughs> that's a typical situation. Uh, most yep, most absolutely. people who would call me with like a computer situation would be doing something like that. Exactly. So my head has expanded. I'm like Glenn <laughs> size now. <laughs> ah, all the way up in here. <laughs> <laughs> so great, great info at Home Studio Simplified. I will be back. Especially, I will be back. Especially interested to see um, if he's going to be doing the same tutorials with Sonar. And yeah, yeah, very yes, cool. Great stuff. And a good topic for tonight as well, getting into virtualization itself and, you know, the nuts and bolts of a bunch of different dogs. Well, and I've been asked by a couple of people, May Mavi asked me if, um, you know, mm -hmm. we could cover some virtualization and, and he wasn't aware that like you could set up a operating system like this and I'm, I'm going to run through it with him a couple of times and. One of my favorite uh, kind of old school versions of that was DOSBox, if you remember that. Um, if you wanted to run old, old, old DOS games on a machine that's a Windows machine, you could run a DOSBox where it's basically you know, you're running DOS 6.2 or whatever and, in, in a little box. And the game you, would run at all your old games. For speed, unless you adjusted it to like play, like may pretend you're an old computer. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Yep, you can actually scale it down. There was a one that was like a speed thing where you could just hit like you know uh, Alt minus or whatever and bring the speed down. It would like bring the CPU clock down to percentages, so you bring it down to one percent, and all of a sudden, you know, because some of those old games were reliant on the, the tick of the clock, so all of a, you jump into a game and, just, and it's done. And you're like, what happened? But then you're able to slow it down, like you said. Who would have thunk it that we'd be slowing down our machines in the future? Yeah. And that's the whole thing is to play the old, old games. You know, now we have even on the uh, the Raspberry Pi, I have a whole game set up where it's, you know, there's retro arcade machines and old DOS games and this and that. And it can all run just on a tiny little Raspberry well, Pi the size and, of a cigarette. And, and, and now all those games, th those are virtual mm -hmm. machines. That's what emulators are. Exactly. Anything that's running exactly. under something is a virtual machine. It's an emulator. It, it just basically takes the modern hardware and simulates the classic hardware for the, the program. Yep, because the, the uh, and the fact that it's so much newer hardware that we're working on now, it only uses only has to use a tiny fraction of your current resources to emulate the old stuff because the old stuff was old and, <laughs> and, and, and nearly the capacity. Those games were tiny compared to today's games. You put 150 tiny. gig, yeah. you download 150 gigs to play one game now. That That's every arcade yeah. game in existence. And you still have a ton of space left over. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, the the number of games that are on that Raspberry Pi build that we have there, I mean, it's all on a tiny little, you know, memory card, but there's so many games on there and so many different, like you said, so many different emulations. You know, you could probably look at, you know, Atari 2600, Atari 5200, you know, Commodore, you know, the, you know Amiga, you know, whatever. Like, you look into any one of those and each is, like you said, its own environment that has its own sub menu with all stuff in there. You know, we're going to have to do a gaming. Good game. stuff. Now that we got an ultimate DAW machine. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, well, my brother, he's asked me several times about, like, you know, setting up an emulator box in upstairs so that mm -hmm. all those games we love sure. to play. And I, I've tried it mm -hmm. a couple of different approaches. And the Pi was the way I mm -hmm. wanted to go. If I can get my hands on a new one. Uh, my old Pi. Yeah, yeah could do it but um wouldn't be as fun but now i can i can make us a, a ultimate gaming machine and we'll test out like that that world and we'll find a way to tie Absolutely. it we'll find it's, it. it's fun world we'll, we'll, we'll tie it to music <laughs> yeah, yeah well this is the music of, of retro arcade machines retro video games hey eight bit and <laughs> all of that that's a popular genre nowadays mm -hmm. Exactly. But we'll work on that next time. Yeah, some food for thought. So come back and join us, everybody, again tomorrow. And join us next week as well. Yep. Tatius is going tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. We'll be back with more talking. Shh. 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 IT. <laughs> Glenn and Tony. See you guys next time. Night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Rawr. A little ambient noise, yeah. So now you're grabbing some uh some band lab clips. Yeah. Now for me that would also be something where I would use like volume automation and like bring that from the bottom, like bring it in and then bring it back out. Kind of. the kinds of sounds you can scratch. With this AI, like scratching it actually can be cool. Oh, that was perfect for the interlude too. Uh -huh. Ends it right in the right I didn't even notice. 40. texture faded out at the interlude until it happened i'm like wait a minute <laughs> sometimes you just you know it was just meant to be that way <laughs>